session. Thank you for attending. I will pre I'm the chair of the session, so I'll be introducing the speakers to you. We will have each presentation will last for 20 minutes, uh, followed by a question round of 10 minutes. So I would like to introduce the first speaker, Sophie Wells, uh, who is from the um, Vienna University of Economics and Business, who will talk about multidimensional wealth inequality. Yes, so thank you very much for the introduction. I am waiting for my slides. Here they are, great. Right, so um, yes, I will talk about multidimensional wealth inequality. So I will talk about first about wealth, about distributional national accounts. Distributional national accounts, you can talk about income, you can talk about consumption, but I will focus here on the wealth component. And I will have a focus on Europe in general. But I'd like to start out by paraphrasing a quote by John F. Kennedy, who said in the 60s that a rising tide lifts all the boats. So meaning, as long as we have economic growth, in the long run, everyone will be better off, the entire part of the society. So the important thing to know is, um, and the important thing to measure is, to measure growth and to measure GDP, um, because in the long run, everyone will benefit from it. The question is, is this really the case? And do we actually have the data to monitor that? And the answer is, we don't really have it right now. Okay, uh, I will talk about wealth inequality here, um, also because we know much less about wealth inequality than as we know about income inequality. And also wealth inequality is directly also linked to other types of inequalities. Um, wealth inequality, particularly during, um, through the generation of capital gains, is directly linked to income inequality. And the more wealth inequality you have, you, the more income inequality you have in the long run and the other way around. Um, when you talk about inequality in macroeconomics, um, the idea is that we want to link, to in, to, in order to monitor whether this rising tide lifts all the boats, we want to link distributional data to macroeconomic data, to aggregates. Um, and the most important macroeconomic data, as we know here, are in the system of national accounts. And what we want to do is to directly link this distributional data to the balance sheets of the household sector to really see when we have growth, how does the household sector, how does the balance sheets change, um, who will have more, who will have less, which components of assets are changing, and how is the distribution of all these components changing over time. Um, also, we would like to have this kind of data for research. Um, more and more macroeconomic models um, bring in more heterogeneity. They want to understand um, how, for instance, the distribution of certain assets and liabilities um, lead to different exposure to risk within a society, what are certain macro channels, how, what are transmission processes, for all these kind of macroeconomic models, we need much more data, much more heterogeneous data to understand it. And it should again be linked to the macro data so that we have, can have these um, consistent models. So the goal of this paper is not to understand all these mechanisms, but to really provide the information and the framework needed to do so. So we want to create this distributional data um, which can serve more or less as a public good to serve to, under, uh, to understanding all these questions. And the goal of this paper is to contribute to establish distributional national accounts um, in the long run. And I will focus here uh, on a couple of European countries. In particular, it will be Austria, Finland, France, Germany, and Spain. So we'll talk about the conceptual framework of how we could actually do it, how we should think about it, what are the functions of this distributional data, and then I will show how we can actually do it for these countries and what are the challenges we currently have. Okay, maybe just first, why is the average not enough? Um, I think when we just take the aggregate and divide it by the number of households we have, the problem is because of a, it's a very skewed distribution, income and wealth as well. Um, we're not talking about some um, central household, we are talking actually about a household that is quite high up in the distribution. So if you line all, uh, up all the people by wealth, the average household will be somewhere here. The same is true for income. It's not like a central household, it's a household that is quite high up in the distribution. So if you look at the average, we are not describing really representative agent in that regard. Also here I'm borrowing a concept from sociologists that would um, classify households in by the use of wealth. So they say renters, they would have wealth or save for precautionary reasons. Then you have owner occupiers. Those are people are actually using the wealth um, for their own use. So they're using their own assets, which means they um, 
save it for a different purpose, and then there are capitalists, those are people who generate income from their wealth. So these are the three functions of wealth, that's how sociologists sometimes define it. When you look at the average household again, it would be actually a very well of owner-occupier, which is again not representative for the entire distribution. Okay, so when you talk about um, distribution national accounts or DINA, there's quite a lot of um, initiatives going on right now. One is around the WIT world data set. Um, so this is um, an academic network that tries to bring together um, distributional data, long time series for as many countries as possible, for as, uh, yeah, as long as possible. Um, they have very well designed methodologies, very well documented, but very often country specific solutions. So whatever data you find in a specific country, you would use that data to create this kind of distributional um, series. Um, so it's not so clear always whether these data are really harmonized or can be compared across countries. And it's also lacking a bit institutional backing in that sense that is not aimed to bring this knowledge directly to the statistical institutes and so on, so that this will be done on a regular basis and disseminated on a regular basis. Um, yes, and there are two international um, expert groups currently working on these topics too. One is the OECD um, Eurostat expert group on disparities in the national accounts framework. There the focus is mainly on income and consumption. And then there's the ECB expert group on linking macro and micro data for the household sector. They exclusively focus on wealth. Um, there's also some other initiatives that are kind of related. Um, those are researchers that would, they try to measure the joint distribution of income, consumption, and wealth, sometimes also referred to the 3D. Um, and that is from the micro side. So they try to measure them jointly because um, Wealth alone doesn't tell you something about prosperity. You also want to know something about income. Are you wealth rich and income rich and also consumption rich? Or how is that interrelated? And I believe in the long run, we should actually bring these two initiatives together and create something which I call here distribution national accounts in 3D. That means that the macro aggregates for income are broken down by different groups. The macro grades for wealth are broken down by groups and consumption as well, but then also the micro data, so the broken down groups are linked together. So I know that the, high, the top income group, how does that distribute to wealth groups and so on. So that is fully integrated and fully linked from all sides. I think that would give us a lots of comprehensive information which we can use for so many things. Okay, I'm talking here about a hybrid approach. I think it's very important when we um, now design distributional national accounts that we have in mind what are actually the functions of this data. And I believe there are two. First one is the one I mentioned so far and focused on so far is that really the link between the macro statistics and the distributional data, so the inequality statistics um, for modeling, for monitoring and so on. But I think the second main function is that this distributional breakdowns per itself are um, give information about wealth distributions and wealth inequality. That means if you only take what is in international accounts, that might be sometimes a bit too limited because it doesn't give you all components of wealth. So if you exclusively follow the national accounts, you may lack a couple of things that are important to measure overall wealth. That means if people then look at this distributional data that are perfectly linked with the national accounts, but there are certain things not in there that are important for wealth, um, that actually produces some um, confusion among users. That would be the one risk. Or uh, also we cannot really interpret it as a wealth inequality measure. I think that would be very hard to communicate that you have a breakdown by wealth for wealth, but it cannot be interpreted as wealth inequality measure. So I think it's very important to keep that in mind that all, uh, all assets and all liabilities that are relevant have to be included, although maybe not all of them are in the national accounts. Okay, so and that is more or less what I have in mind. So um, here is, okay, so when you look at it vertically, I have several groups. That could be, for instance, the poorest 20%, then the, so, so wealth quintiles, for instance, but also other qualitative breakdowns like renters, owners, and capitalists, as we had before, or also income groups, or rural versus urban, something like that. And then, um, Horizontally, 
Um, here we have all the components that are in the national accounts and that can be currently linked to microdata. So where we have a source for that also. Um, and then what I believe is important to have is to add all the other components that may not be in the national accounts or cannot be linked right now. But I believe it is very important to add them here so that when you sum up here, you get an overall measure for net wealth for these households. Okay. Um, the definition of wealth per se is not so easy to have. Um, I focus here, I actually took it from the OECD, what they defined as wealth um, from this micro manual. And it's all about exercise, it's about the ex, um, ownership rights. So wherever you own something and you can sell it right now, that is considered as wealth. That also means that um, some parts of pension wealth is maybe not included, or at least has to be treated differently. So what I have in here are the following components. Um, so liabilities, deposits, bonds, so all um, financial assets, real assets, um, but also things like vehicles, valuables, and a couple of other things. And what you see here is that is the list of assets that can be currently linked to the micro data, uh, to the macro data, because there we have a perfect match between survey data and macro data, which is not so much. And if you miss all those here, just because the definitions are not very good right now, it would mean we have a very truncated concept of wealth if we only look at those. That's why we want to have all of them together, although they might not be perfectly linkable right now, but in the future, more and more asset groups could move actually to the integrated accounts. Right, vertically, uh, I break it down by, well, net worth quintiles itself, but then also gross income quintiles, so I break down wealth by income groups. Um, these are the functions of wealth, I mentioned them already. And in the long run, I also want to have disposable income um, and also equivalent disposable income as a proxy for living standards. Okay. So this is a bit like um, why I think this comprehensive measure of breaking things down by several component, uh, by several dimensions is important. So here I have the income groups, here for welcome, uh, wealth groups, and here I have the functions of wealth. And what we see is, okay, so most people that are at the bottom of the income distribution, so many people are also at the bottom of the wealth distribution, but not all of them. They go actually everywhere. The same is true for, for renters. We would have that feeling that they would all be in the, at the very bottom of the income and wealth distribution as well. They are mainly, but you also find them somewhere else. So to get an overall comprehensive picture, it's very important to look at all these dimensions at the same time. And then when you talk about really um, um, prosperous households or so, you can actually say, I want to look at those people that are at the top everywhere. So people that have high income, high wealth, and are also having, are also classified as capitalists in that sense. On the other hand, you want to look at really poor people when they are at the bottom in all three dimensions. Right. I'll talk a little bit about um, data. Um, Generally, there are two opinions, which data to use. It's administrative data or survey data. I think the old question. Um, here, what I would try to do is to find a solution that works for as many countries as possible in the most harmonized ways possible so that we can do cross-country comparisons. Um, right. Also, what is, um, yeah. So administrative data would be register data, tax data, and so on. The major problem is that it's a very indirect measure of wealth usually. Um, so you, when you have inheritance taxes or so, not everything is taxed. When you have um, some kind of property taxes, it's only real assets that is taxed, so you don't have an overall tax or so administrative data where really wealth is collected. It's very indirect. So for every asset class, you would have to have different methods to actually conclude the distribution of wealth. And it's usually also not linked to socioeconomic characteristics. You cannot break it down by income and all these things because this information is just not there. In contrast, survey data um, comes with all this extra data, um, has this link with socioeconomic characteristics. It can be very easily harmonized across countries. Um, but on the other hand, we know surveys are not working for everything. There are a couple of sampling problems, measurement problems, and so on. So neither approach is perfect, but I believe combining the two is probably preferable. And that is more or less what I try to show here semantically. So when you have administrative data, you 
compute the distribution of every component of wealth separately. Then you have to aggregate them in a way. Um, so different asset classes, bring them together and to get an overall wealth distribution. On the other hand, when you have a survey as a linking component, you could still use administrative data as an input for the survey. But then you have the survey that comes with all the social economic characteristics. Um, you can benefit from the administrative data by incorporating it into the survey to get then an overall wealth um, distribution, which is linked to all other dimensions. Okay. So um, what I want to show in the last five minutes is that um, wealth, um, that wealth service usually are lacking the very top of the distribution. And that is actually the main problem for using it for distribution at national accounts because a huge part is lacking at the very top. That's what you see here at this table, that the maximum wealth in a survey, that's a couple of surveys here, and the minimum wealth for the Forbes list, there's usually a large gap, a substantial gap. When talking about wealth distributions, you kind of have to control for this missing wealthy. And the problem is also when you look at tax data, this is some data from uh, this paper here, where they show that also administrative data lack the very top because of tax avoidance. So the problem is that we don't have the top, it's in both data sources. And I think this is, that's why where, whatever data you use, you have to kind of control for it. And I do it here in this paper in two ways. I use a Pareto approach and a generalized Pareto approach by using um, survey data and um, information from rich lists which I, so I assume that the top follows a Pareto distribution. Then I add observations from rich list to estimate the, the shape of this Pareto distribution and then um, compute how much is actually missing in the survey to adjust for this missing top. Um, yeah, that's what I do. Um, and the other approach is a generous Pareto approach where I actually use for those countries where we have um, wealth distributions estimated from tax data, corrected for missing wealth and tax havens. Then I have the top wealth share. I again assume a generous Pareto top tail. Um, then I use these top shares that are estimated from registered data and then adjust the survey with that. And what I just want to, sorry, um, what I show you, um, so maybe this one first. For France and for Spain, I can do both. So I can use this rich list to make this adjustment, and I can use tax data to use the adjustments, and I can use tax data enriched with um, estimates for how much is actually stored in offshore wealth havens. And what we see here is that regardless, so when I use, so that's the change in total wealth in the survey when I do that, sorry. Um, when I use tax data only, it increases in France by roughly 8%, uh, similarly in Spain. But when I use tax data and an estimate of how much is in offshore wealth havens, or when I use rich list data, it's roughly 11% here, or roughly 9 to 10% here. That means it's always quite similar. That means if you do not make these adjustments, it has a huge impact. But whatever kind of additional data I use, I get very similar results. So it doesn't really matter what kind of data I have to make these adjustments, but it's very important to do these adjustments. And I just jump back one slide to show you for the other countries where I don't have text data to make these checks, I can only use rich list data. And what we see here, that's again the, total ch the change in total wealth. It differs quite substantially from country to country. But when we look more closer into how the surveys are run, um, the size of this adjustment heavily correlates in how good the survey is. So in Finland, the change is very small because the survey is mainly administrative data. So it's only some questions are asked really in the survey, most of it is filled up with administrative data. So here we have a very small change. Then we have in between France and Spain, where they um, use very fine grained um, data to oversample the very rich. Um, and that leads to, we still have an adjustment when we control for the very top, but it's smaller than in countries like Austria and Germany, where we have here up to 40% of change, where Austria is not oversampling at all, right? So they don't oversample the very rich at all. That means if I expose a just for the missing rich, I get very large changes. Germany tries to oversample, but they cannot, they don't have very good data for doing that. They just have some geographical oversampling strategy, right? Not so important. But the only thing is what you see here is, although this is a harmonized survey, um, the changes, first of all, survey results are quite different. And when I do this top tail adjustment, it really reflects the quality of the survey. 
That means the better the server is designed, the less you have to adjust exposed, but it is very important to make exposed adjustments to kind of get comparable statistics. If you do not do that, you will measure differences in wealth inequality that are driven by differences in the survey methodology, but not actually driven by differences in inequality, right? So that's one of the main points I want to point out. <coughs> okay, and yes, so I just give you some highlights of what you can actually see in this data when you make all these computations and calculations, because it gives you so much information, and so many things to analyze. For instance, okay, we know that wealth is heavily concentrated at the very top, um, we can make these comparisons across countries. Um, what you also find always is that wealth concentration is lower when measured against the income distribution, which means there is no perfect correlation between wealth, the wealth distribution and the income distribution, which we see also in this data. Um, the top 20% in terms of income own be, uh, between 50 and 60% of total wealth. So there is a, small, a concentration, but it's not as much as one would have thought maybe. Um, the share of capitalists, as I defined them, ranges between 10 and 20% in Spain. So also there we have quite differences across countries. Um, yeah, here something very interesting, I believe. So 10% roughly in the euro area are households that are income poor, wealth poor, and renters. So those are really the most vulnerable people. On the other hand, roughly 4.5% are at the very, very top. Okay. Right, and then there are some other results which are all in the paper if you're interested in, and maybe I just use five more seconds to summarize up. Um, so I believe that all the surveys have many problems. They're probably still the best starting point for wealth DINA because it produces kind of comparable statistics when you make these kind of adjustments to make service comparable. Um, the more you can um, adjust services, objective data with administrative data, the better the survey will be. Um, I believe it's very important to keep in mind the double function of DINA, so it's important to keep all asset classes so that you do not confuse users. Um, I think adjusting for the missing wealth is not only interesting per se, but it's also fundamental, because if you do not do that, you will get biased results. Um, very important point, I think, is that the magnitude of the top tail adjustment correlates with the quality of the service, so we should focus on also improving the, uh, the service, probably. Um, whatever you use, whether it might be rich lists or top wealth shares estimated from tax data, whatever, all works very well, all lead to very similar results in those countries where I have several data sources. Um, yeah. Right. And those are some next steps I want to do is to also connect this wealth also with disposable income, some, something that's currently not in the survey, currently only have gross income but also make this disposable income link so that I can then in the next step link it with distribution national accounts for income. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. So are there any questions for Sophie? Um, I mean, not whether, whether the groups are of interest, but really there is a relationship between income and wealth, uh, and although it's not, not that straightforward, it's all in the end the same uh, national function level, but did you look at that as well? Um, no, so everything I did here is now really cross-sectional. Um, because um, that's already a lot of work to do that for one year right now. So that's really the idea to make it work for one year for many countries and to work on the definitions and the conceptual links. Um, what you are saying is that would be interesting to see over time, right? How do they co-move or not co-move together? Um, I believe this is actually something, like a reason why we want to have this kind of data, because that will give us in the long run this information to monitor it, but this is now really the um, first step of getting it right for one year and then, you know, um, produce it in the future. But the temporal link so far I haven't really worked on now. Yeah, and as you know, for, and we 
see it in all countries for lower income points out, and there is no problem for them. Uh, <laughs> most significant, we see a very negative statement. And I wonder whether, if you look at the same group, uh, how the wealth development is, whether you will see that back. So I think it's incredibly important to get at some yes. stage that that link. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if I have this. Oh yeah, here are income groups actually. So asset classes broken down by five income groups. And um, okay, so, okay, here it's not, in Germany it's not true, but for many other countries, the net worth of the first income group would actually be negative. So it's not only negative saving rates, but also negative stocks because they have more liabilities than assets. Yeah. So in Germany, for the one table I have here, you don't see it, but for many other countries, you would see that. But it would be interesting to see the change. Exactly, but this is like right now really like one year. And, but I believe that would be actually one of the interesting things to monitor. If you have these tables that are linked and you link the income groups to the wealth groups and so on, you really see how this changes over time. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I forgot to mention, if, uh, if you have a question, could you please say your name and organization? Thank I you very much for doing that. Yeah, so <laughs> because you said that, then I remembered I should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the gentleman next to you also. Uh, that was about the same as what I was Okay, so are there further questions? Yes. Are you able to, oh, sorry, thank you for uh, Peter Matchik. Department for Worker Pensions in the UK. Um, I was wondering, are you able to do by characteristics? So would you be able to look at the sort of wealth of pensioners, for instance? Because obviously I think there's quite a kind of age sort of um, dimension to this as well. Yeah, that's one thing. Um, people always want to have age. The problem is here the measurement unit are households. So what is the age of household? Um, if I want to, I mean, I have the age of all the household members and I can make some assumptions. How would you split wealth between household members? and then you can do something like really age. I've seen some people just taking the age of the um, household head. I think this is not a very good thing because the household head is a bit random how this is chosen, right? Um, yeah. So um, that would be interesting, I absolutely agree, but I think then we come really to this question, how is wealth split within a household? I was recently talking to someone, maybe you should look at divorce data or so, that's actually when you, when it's realized how was the, how is the wealth really to be split. Um, but otherwise we here measure it on a household level. So I'm a bit reluctant of really talking about age here. Uh, we have time for one more question, if there is one. If there are no more questions, then I will thank you. Thank Sophie for her presentation. And then I will introduce the next speaker who is Dennis Fixler from the US Bureau of Economic Analysis and he will uh, present on improving the measure of the distribution of personal income. Uh, happy to be here today. So what I'm going to talk about is some ongoing work on the distribution of personal income at the BEA. It's resurrecting and extending uh, what was done uh, many years ago. So let me just talk about the reason or uh, the motivation for the current attention. So the top black line is the Piketty, Saez, Zuckman, uh, top 1% share profile. Uh, the blue line is Auten and Splinter. That's a two, um, one's Treasury, U.S. Treasury, one's Congressional Budget Office. Looking at tax data, which is also the basis for Piketty, Zayas, and Zuckman, and you see that they get a very different uh, time profile for the top 1%. The Congressional Budget Office also does distributional analysis. They have a concept of market income, which is different than the tax-based income for uh, Alton Splinter. And then the, um, this paper is with uh, Marina Gendelsky and David Johnson. And so we have our two observations there in red. Um, and we're 
you know, as I'll talk about, we'll fill in the time series, but you see we're, we're more in line with the other two than the um, Piketty, Zayas, and uh, Zuckman. And I said resurrecting, and so BEA used to do distribution of personal income up until 1971. Uh, it was dropped for resources. And if you look at the um, distribution here for the shares, um, it's a pretty stable period going from post-World War II until 1971. This is often referred to as the great period of sharing for the growth of GDP. And then you can look at the 1929 bar graph, and you see that, yes, uh, quite a diff bit different distribution than for, let's say, uh, in the later years, and it's due to the uh, depression. So what's the current motivation here? GDP is increasing. What's your uh, growth goes to uh, what part of the distribution? Disconnect between micro measures and macro measures, and this is part of the OECD, we're, we're participating in the OECD effort to uh, come up with a distributional national accounts. So a little bit more specifics about the three diagrams I uh, put up there. So Piketty, Zayas, and Zuckman, national income. And, and so one of the themes of, of our analysis here is the concept of income matters. And you tell very different stories if you change the concept of income. So Piketty, Zayas, and Zuckman, national income, and uh, I've put the, national, the US definition of national income there. It's slightly different, I think, than the SNA definition. And notice that the unit of observation is the individuals. These are individual um, based because they drive it from tax data. Auten and Splinter use tax data as well. Jerry Auten is at the Treasury and he knows the tax laws very well, and one of the complaints he has for Piketty, Zayas, and Zuckman is they don't take into account changes in the tax laws, they don't take into account the difference between pre-tax and after transfer in income, and so they find a lower income share using tax data. This, our paper, is we're going to use the distribution of personal income, but getting it from, um, I'll show you from the Census Bureau's um, uh, uh, population survey. So it's personal income and the relationship is to national income on, on this equation. And you can see there's a lot of ad additions and subtractions. Notice that there's corporate profits, taxes on production, uh, government social insurance. The correlation in the movements between personal income and national income is very close, very high. But it's, it's a different, and the personal, what we're going to do is focus on households, uh, not individuals. So the current population survey is our main source, the annual supplement of, uh, of social and economic statistics. Uh, we picked two years, uh, I'll show you for 2007, 2012, and then we use the latest national income and product account tables. Now, one of the things we wanted to achieve here is because this income distribution topic, um, there are so many different estimates of it, one of the things that we wanted to do is to make sure that it was going to be as transparent as possible for, for our users. And so what we decided to do is that we would use publicly available data as much as possible so that if people wanted to look at what we did or test what we did, they would be able to do so. So we use the public use CPS, we use all these other sources. The only sort of uh, private source here is this last part, the 1040, that's the federal tax um, form, 1040 for personal income, for uh, household income. Or, and it's micro data and it's internal. The Census Bureau gets a subset of the tax files for their use and so We've used that, as I'll show you, for estimating uh, the tail. So broadly speaking, what we do is we take the, the CPS, we adjust the top incomes with the table, uh, Pareto imp imputation, and I'll, I'll show you why we did that. Uh, we distribute the national income product totals by components to household. Where that we can use the CPS, we will use the CPS as allocation, and we'll use those, other, those supplemental data sources for additional distributional information. We aggregate them and we construct inequality statistics for 2007 and 2012. So 
normally people want to use the tax data to improve the estimates of survey data, the presumption being that the income variables are more reliable on the administrative tax data than they are on survey data. And so what we did is a, in this paper that uh, um, Marina uh, presented at IARIW last year, looking at taking a matched file between the uh, census file and the um, IRS files and seeing what happens to the difference for the same households between the tax number and the CPS number for an income that's restricted to wages, uh, interest and dividends. And, and what we found is that it's not unidirectional as we thought it would be. That it's pluses and minuses um, and you can see that uh, from minus 10,000 to 1,000 to minus 10,000, there are two big peaks there. And if I put this in terms of quintiles, if I looked at the graph of what the, dis the differences were for the first quintile and the fifth quintile, I'd find the same kind of graph. So the tax data was, is not satisfactory here to uh, take care of the um, misreporting and the tail. So what we decided to do is to use the tax file at the Census Bureau and impute the upper tail using a uh, single parameter Pareto distribution. We picked a $500,000 threshold that roughly represents 1% of, 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 of income. And then we in, took that distribution and imputed it for the current population survey household um, for over 500,000, and it mattered. The mean went from about 800,000 for over 500 to 1.2 million. So it, 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 it did its job in terms of um, increasing the tail. So let me give you an example. So household with 600,000 of pseudo income. So the Census Bureau has this concept of money income, which is the basis for the current population survey and we're gonna to try to go to personal income. So we needed an intermediate concept of income. So that's what we labeled pseudo income. And it's, it's basically the same as the current population money income. It's where they overlap and it eliminates things from the current population survey that are not in personal income, prim primarily retirement income. The Census Bureau includes uh, the retirement income and the money income. In the national accounts, we don't do that because it's not payments for current production. So, so in this example here, if you had $60 in dividend income, the tail adjustment made your $600,000 to $700,000, and we proportionally adjusted the dividend to, to $70. The total dividend income in the CPS is summed to that's $123 billion, and then we, the NIPA total, and then we just, comp uh, and you can see how we aggregate the weights and, and come up with a, a, a number. So all the components were scaled that way, such that the household may end up with 900,000 of household income, and it's consistent with uh, the NIPA. So what I'm gonna do is show you some of the results here. So I'm gonna go through the components of personal income. I'll show you the distribution by quintile. I'll talk about inc income inequality across income definitions and time. And I'm going to show you the importance of regional considerations in going to the states. So components of personal income. So you see the top line is what we call the pseudo income. And three major additions from personal income. So the first we call it, uh, finance. So this is the imputed interest for financial services. This is the imputed interest income on pensions, the imputed interest in, on uh, insurance. Health in the United States, so this is uh, the, the transfers from government, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, net transfers are other social transfers, less the contributions, and you can see here that the averages are negative, the contributions are greater. And this last line, per, uh, is um, equals household income. So one of the problems in national accounts is the personal income includes the nonprofit institution serving households. So what we decided to do was use the, the BEA household income, which is, takes out the, the uh, nonprofit institutions. And you could see that we had the nonprofit institutions as a separate line. 
And then the personal income is, is, is the final one. And so in this paper, we looked at household income because, again, the idea here is you want to focus on household income. So unlike the national income concept that uh, Piketty et al. used, our view is personal income, household income is what's important. And from a macro point of view, it's important because this is what consumption functions and macro models are based on. They use disposable personal income. They're not using national income here. So if you want to make this link between macroeconomic analysis and distribution, it's got to come through personal income. And so uh, we decided to take out the nonprofit, so we left it as uh, household income. So here's just a picture we looked by quintiles of the, of the distribution looking at 2012. So the interesting thing here is look at the income receipts and compare it to uh, rental income. Or you look at, even better, look at the distribution of current transfer receipts um, compared to income receipts. And you could see, as, as you would expect, the income receipts is all the top quintile and the current transfer is, is, is focused on the um, bottom quintiles. Um, what we extended, what wasn't done in BEA before and what we did now, is to take this decomposition of the components and give a distribution to that. So if you look at compensation to employees, again, you see it's focused on the top quintile. But look at the rental income. Um, and you could see that if I look at the government social benefits, it's a not surprising how that distribution went. These are shares of the total by quintile. Um, the other interesting one is proprietor's income. You could see, not surprisingly, that the fifth quintile's got 83% share of the uh, rentals, uh, proprietor's income. So these weren't surprising, but it's important. Uh, interest income, dividend income, also heavily to the <coughs> top quintile. So what we looked at here is what people, are in terms of inequality, so if I look at the, the money income, the Census Bureau, and I compare the, for 2012, look at the means, means change, the pseudo income mean is higher than the money income mean, mainly because this is the effect of the tail adjustment. So the tail is bigger, so we're gonna get a higher uh, mean. If you look at the three genies though, I mean, they're, they're different, but they're not hugely different. That You would think something is you know, really strange here. But I think the telling number is the 90-10 uh, ratio. So the, the, the criteria of the, the lowest category of the 90th percentile and the lowest category of the 10th. And so our measure of household income tells a substantially different story about inequality than does the uh, census money income which is the official Gini number uh, and the official distribution in the United States currently. If I go to 2007, I get the same kind of answer. So this to us was very, you know, it's very telling that the incorporating transfers basically is a big deal. And these other concepts um, don't. So, Let's go to now these other studies I put up on the board uh, in the screen earlier and go to the uh, top 1% share. So for us, um, it was 13.3 in, in 2012, 12.5 in, 20, in uh, 2007. Uh, the pre-tax national income, this is the Piketty, Saez, and, and Zuckman, look, 20.8% 20, is the top share. It's hugely, hugely different and quite different than the um, other two. So yesterday's talk about Brexit and trust and statistics, and there was this discussion about the importance of regional distributions here. So here, um, I think I can show you, at least for the United States, that taking into account price difference matters. So the first column here is median nominal GDP, uh, uh, median nominal household income. Green is high, red is low, and yellow is in the middle. And you can see that the District of Columbia, which is a city state in the United States, the capital, it has the highest. And 
Arkansas is the lowest, and Michigan is in the middle. So what I did is, or what we did is, we took the, what we produce is a regional price parity, which is a multilateral price index across the United States at a point in time. So it's not an inflation measure across time, it's a spatial price index. And so I deflated, for 2012, we deflated the medians by the price index, and lo and behold, Minnesota now is the highest median income, Indiana's in the middle, and Hawaii is the lowest. And Hawaii was not the lowest if you look nominally, it was about in the middle. The reason being, Hawaii's prices are 18% higher than the U.S. average. And so if I look at the means, I get the same kind of change in ordering, taking into account changes in the purchasing power of money across space. Uh, so this was pretty revealing, and I imagine that um, uh, different states are going to talk about how they should be getting different money here uh, based on the purchasing power here. So if I look at some of the states in particular, District of Columbia, look at the fifth uh, quintile here, household income. Somebody would cynically joke, this is why inequality is such a big discussion in, in the uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and so... If I look at Michigan and Arkansas, they're not so much different in the fifth quintile. They're closer. I mean, one's higher than the other, but it's not this qualitative difference between that and um, the district. If I look at by regions here, uh, so you can compare New York, New Jersey, and you see that they're higher. Uh, 90-10s are, the spread is pretty high. If I go to the Midwest, the genies are about the same. The 90-10 ratios, which I think is a better indicator than the, than the genie, the 90-10 ratios are much more clustered than anywhere else in, in, in any other region in the United States. If I go to the West, the West has the highest average genie and the highest average 90-10 ratio. So there it was just in a, a different world. The South is, the results are kind of peculiar because of the District of Columbia. I mean, you could see the 90-10 ratio is huge compared to everybody else. And so, just as a thought experiment, I took the District of Columbia, took it away, and gave it the average of its two adjacent states, Virginia and Maryland, and it became much more reasonable with the, with the uh, Midwest and, and the South. As a, uh, taking away the outlier of the district. Uh, so <clears throat> regionally, we have different stories. It's a big country, but um, the Midwest seems to be much more uh, equal than any place else uh, in the United States. So in sum, we construct the distribution of personal income using mainly public use data. That was, that was the goal. Um, Pew to Pareto distribution for the top income, top shares for household income align well with the Aunt and Splinter and, and CBO. Income definitions, highly significant. So this is one of the takeaways here. You have to have some cons consistent concept of income. Gini shows little change. 90-10 ratio, this, this is, the, I think, the, the real story here. Um, and the non-money income allocated to income groups is, is extremely important for the story you're going to tell. So I started off with our two dots. So the ongoing research now is we're going to fill in 2007 to 2012 and then go all the way to 2017-18. The data sources I put up on, on the uh, screen on the second slide, second or third slide, part of the problem is we don't get them all at the same time. So, so, so the time, time frame for the receipt of data goes from about nine months to almost three years. And so what we can do, how far we can go, is going to depend on, on that time flow. Uh, we're, going to, we're working with the OECD people about, you know, part of this task force about developing a consistent, comparable distribution of measures of PCE. We're going to look at savings. We, you know, from a macro point of view, we produce macro statistics. We want to be able to help people conduct average propensity consume, do multi regional multipliers 
for the impact of fiscal policy. So that's on the agenda. On the agenda, I didn't put on here, we're gonna look at distribution of consumption. The US Federal Reserve recently came out with a distribution of wealth, uh, entered into discussions with them. We're gonna see if we can use their distribution of wealth and bring it to personal income as defined in the national accounts. To, so we have the triad here, consumption, wealth, and income uh, on the same distributional basis, ideally. So that's what we're going for. I think I'm out of time. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> so are there any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. So just, Dennis, when you're looking at the, um, the uh, PAC data matched to the CPS data, how do you handle the people who aren't in the PAC register but show up in the CPS? <laughs> so what we did is the first thing was to take the characteristics and match CPS to tax records. So if you didn't, if, you, if there were non-filers, right, they wouldn't be picked up in this match. So that was the first criteria, matching the tax data with the filers. So this is by characteristics, of course. No, we, you, 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 the Census Bureau doesn't have names, so we, it was, ad, it was, you know, all the other variables okay. that you can do, yeah. There's a con strong, very strong confidentiality uh, protection here. Thank you. Uh, next question? Yeah. Well, I already myself. <laughs> People forgot. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's not the full file, it's restricted in the variables mainly. So it, it's, it's, I don't even know, I, I can't say for sure if it's every tax filer. Somehow the Census Bureau gets a subset of the master tax file, okay. But I wonder whether the sample also has an underrepresentation with really the census. I don't know, I don't think so. So our Pareto is based on the tax filing. So the Pareto is estimated using the tax data that the Census Bureau gets. So, it would, so that's why the ta that, that would be the only source of getting the tail. So they distribute, so my understanding is it's, it's, uh, it's individual based, right, by tax unit, and it's only for adults over 20 years old. 
So it's not a per capita type of thing. So they, they, they just made this cutoff that they're going to allocate according to uh, adults over 20 years old. I don't know what they did for allocating the corporate profits. What we did for allocating, let's say, the finance part is we used the uh, Fed's Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finances and used their, their, their bank asset proportion. We used that for ours. For their retirement income part of their assets, we used that distribution. So we tried to match likes with likes as much as possible. And that's why we didn't restrict it to the current population survey because the data for the distribution there is just not as good as a, it is on the survey of consumer finances. The final is any plans for now counting? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy one. <laughs> well, thank you very much for no, the No, so part of the reason I meant the, com the comment about the timeline, okay, so to do it right takes, takes the data. So from an empirical point of view, from every, I looked at uh, uh, Census Bureau Gini coefficients over time. The movement for the past 25 years has been about 0.3 percent per year. It's been fairly stable. It, so my view is, is it really worth it to to spend the resources to now cast a number that's very, very small moving? And Gini coefficients are not going to move quarterly. I I, I wouldn't well, think. Even more annually, more, I mean. More recent, uh, more time to yes. So if we can get within a year, two years, uh, it's probably yeah. going to be good enough, I think. That's good. Okay, so there was one more question from the gentleman over here. Yes. Yes. Top 1% estimate is all in how, how do you do that distribution? So, um, I mean, you may can, you know, can tell me something a bit more about how to do that um, attribution towards the dog for different types of income. Um, but my question was really then um, kind of what can we learn from this um, for other countries? Because the, the other lesson from that trickiness. Mm -hmm. That, as Orson and Slinter rightly point out, is extremely sensitive to the definitions in the tax code, right. which, which are very different across countries. So right. I wonder whether, when Dale is in kind of um, revealing me about you know, whether, whether, this, whether this can be applied in other countries and what differences you might expect to find in different countries. Um, I don't know what the supplemental data is. It probably varies by country by country. I mean, we found it extremely useful to just be very open-minded about what could be used for distributional or allocation purposes. So we used the Fed. We went to Congressional Budget Office for a lot of the um, uh, social stuff, the social transfers. We went to the, the entity that collects all the data from Medicare and Medicaid. We used their distribution for that. So the lesson we learned is you, you, if you want to allocate a particular component, the best thing to do is to go to the, as best you can to the source of the, the component and use their distribution. Because the, these blanket rules of thumb just, just don't seem to work very well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yes, yes. That's I, I agree with you. I, it, it's it's if it's misreporting, then it's a real issue. Uh, the the U.S. Treasury runs every so often a what they call a very intensive audit of a sample to try to get at ratios of misreporting for the sole proprietors and and these kinds of things. So thank you very much for the questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> Sorry. <Thank you. laughs> So the next speakers, there will be two in this panel, <laughs> uh, on measuring household disposable income. So there will be Peter Matek from the Department of Work and Pensions and Martin Schein from the ONS. Uh, Richard Tonkin, who is also mentioned here, is in the audience if you want to ask him questions. Yes. Hello. So um, this is work looking at uh, measuring household disposable income in official UK statistics and our work introducing a top income adjustment. And as Tani said, this is a joint um, presentation between myself at ONS and Peter at the Department for Work and Pensions. So a bit of background about why we need a top income adjustment in our work. Um, so firstly, the two main sources we have of official household income statistics in the UK are households below average income, which is known as HBAI. And this is produced by DWP and is based on the Family Resources Survey and at the ONS, we produce the effects of taxes and benefits, which I'll refer to as ETB, and this is based on the living costs and food survey. So when it comes to um, issues of measuring incomes of the top income individuals, um, it's kind of a well-reported issue um, in survey data in different survey types in different countries across the world. We see issues that um, top income individuals are underreported and undercovered in these um, data. This obviously has consequent impacts that the income of the highest income households is underreported, and then also then, therefore, as we're not picking up top incomes correctly, overall inequality um, is actually higher in real life than what we report at the moment. So just to show this, this is a chart where we um, took the quantiles in tax data in a tax data set called the survey of personal incomes, and we compared that made a ratio of that against quantiles in our survey data set from the effects of taxes and benefits. So when we see the ratio above one, that means that the quantile in the tax data set is showing a higher income than that quantile in the equivalent survey data set. So as you see, once we go towards uh, um, the top end of the distribution, particularly about the 98th quantile, we see um, a big jump above one for these three years, um, which shows that we're seeing far higher levels of income in the tax data set than in the survey data set, which is showing the issue of underreporting we have with top income individuals. Um, so the current status of top income adjustments in the UK is that um, DWP already have one in place, which Peter will talk through at, in a moment. Um, and at the ONS, we're in the process of introducing our own top income adjustment, which is what we're here to present. Um, both of these top income adjustments are based on a tax data set, which I used to show that graph on underreporting on earlier. This tax data set is provided by HMRC and is a stratified sample of tax records. Um, it's called the Survey of Personal Incomes, um, and this is shortened to SBI, and hence often you'll hear the top income adjustment known as the SBI adjustment. And now I'll hand over to Peter, who will explain what DWP currently do as their top income adjustment. Thanks, Martin. Um, so yeah, I'm going to explain our current topping of distribution, the adjustments. Um, so basically, what we do is we um, we look at we we rank our uh, our survey data by individual incomes, and we basically throw away the survey data of, at the top. Um, so what we do is replace a fixed proportion of the survey with averages from the SPI. And um, so the, the first thing is we replace the actual case level data with averages. So this basically 
sort of removes some of the volatility. So one year we might have a very high outlier, the next year we might not have that outlier, and that can cause volatility, but also scales up the kind of case level and reporting. So if that case is sort of missing out some of its income, well, that's, that's scaled up this way. But also we have too few of those types of cases as well. So the reweighting part of the methodology then sort of scales up the cases we do have. And what I'm going to do sort of on the next few slides is sort of talk through what, what happens if we just regross, just reweight, and if we do both of those things. Um, the other thing I should mention, based on what Dennis said, is that we're doing this sort of a year after our survey finishes, and at that point we don't have the final tax, tax records data set, so we're using a projected survey of personal incomes data, and that also has an impact because obviously there's lots of kind of behavioural responses to the tax changes that it's quite a kind of difficult to ask for HMRC to sort of model that pr correctly. So how much do we adjust? It's sort of, there's no sort of scientific basis for these proportions. They've, they've evolved over time, I'm afraid. Um, but we basically do it for 0.36% of non-pensioners and 1.16% of pensioners and separately for GB in Northern Ireland because of some of our grossing regime. Um, so that's sort of our, our unadjusted Gini coefficients. Um, so this is when we've, we've taken our individual level income data, we've summed it up to a household level and we've equivalized it to work out our inequality statistics. And you'll see sort of some of the problems I mentioned are, are sort of seen in this data set. So it's kind of very spiky and that's, that's not sort of realistic in, in the situation of genies being quite sort of um, static over time and slow moving. Um, and you can see, if anything, the, the latest period is, is historically low if you just use the unadjusted series. So the last sort of four or five years, you know, it's never been lower since 94, 95. So now I'm going to um, turn on the, um, the sort of case level adjustment. So here's where I throw away the top of the distribution and then just um, use the SPI averages. And you'll see, as I say, the volatility has been reduced quite a lot. Um, but the overall levels properly about the same overall level. So the next one is when I actually um, keep the cases as they are, but overweight them. And obviously what I'm doing there is sort of scaling up the volatility as well, because that outlier, not only is it there, it's now got a higher weight than it had before. Um, but when I do both at the same time, um, it's now not so volatile, and it's sort of moved upwards. And interestingly, I suppose, over time, if anything, the gaps increase. So the kind of the, the burden carried by this top income distribution adjustment has, has grown. And the other thing that sort of changes is that the, it's still sort of lower than, the inequality is still lower in the latest period than sort of the mid-2000s, but it's now around the level of 94, 95, rather than lower than it. Um, but sort of, it probably, it's, it was described in Stephen Jenkins' paper as, 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 as pioneering, but sort of, it's just on or off, and there's sort of random sort of numbers put in there. Um, so ONS, with, with our help, have, have sort of refined this method, and, and Martin's going to talk through some of the options he's gone through. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, so in terms of developing a new adjustment, so um, we had a set of criteria we wanted to make this new top income adjustment. Um, so we wanted it to be methodologically sound and based on academic standards, and hence we've sought help from Stephen Jenkins, Andy Summers at LSE, and a lot of help from the Resolution Foundation. Um, we wanted it to be transparent and understandable by users, so the method can be easily explained. And then we wanted the adjustment to be made on underlying microdata rather than just aggregated data. Um, we built on methods already existing from DWP, and then also um, later a paper suggested by Stephen Jenkins' group in Berkhouse et al. Um, suggested improvements to the current DWP method. Um, so we've got a couple of methods which we're trialing. So the first one we've labeled as the quantile method. So what we do is we take our survey data, which is the effects of taxes and benefits, and the tax data, which is the survey of personal income data. We get that to an individual level and we rate it by, rank it, sorry, by gross income. Um, we then decide a threshold, which we're going to adjust the survey data above and then quantile groups above this threshold. So in this example, I've adjusted everyone above the 96 quantile um, and done 0.5% quantile groups. Then what we do is we take the mean average for each SBI quantile group, um, and then we impute that onto individuals in the equivalent survey quantile groups. 
Um, and this results in us having a survey data set, um, which kind of represents our original data, but at the top end of the distribution where we have that under-reporting we talked about earlier, it now represents the tax data set as we've imputed those incomes on top. Now, uh, the other method we've been trialing um, is more similar to the current DWP method, but it's a bit more complex. So we start off the same where we rank the ETB and the SBI, so the tax and the survey data by gross income, and then similarly, we decide a threshold to adjust above and the size of the quantile groups. So this example, um, adjusting above the 98th quantile with 1% width quantile groups. Then what we do is we take the quantile boundaries from the tax data set and we look at what is the income in those boundaries. Um, and then what we do is we take these income measurements and then we create bands in our survey data um, so individuals within these income boundaries from the tax data set. Then what we do is we, similarly to the quantile approach, we impute the income um, from the tax data set onto these bands in the uh, survey data set. But then what we do is we increase the weight so that the weight of the individuals in the um, survey data is the same as the weight of the individuals in the quantile groups in the tax data. Um, and then, of course, we have to reweight re the rest of the data so we're back to the same population totals as before. Um, and this results similarly in a data set where the majority is still the original survey data set, but at the top we have the incomes adjusted and actually reweighted to match the top of our tax data set that we're using. So things to note is that for simplicity's sake, I didn't include this in the flow diagrams, but we impute separately for retired and non-retired individuals because when we looked at under-reporting by the retired split, we saw the issues of under-reporting at the top of the retired distribution and also the non-retired distribution. Um, as Peter discussed, we're having to use projected SBI data for the most recent years as the full kind of microdata doesn't come out until a couple of years afterwards. Um, and for reasons we're not sure about, there's currently no SBI data available for 2008 um, slash 2009. So things we need to decide about the adjustment, I've run you through the method, but there's lots of details we are trying to determine, and hence here seeking feedback. Um, so we have the threshold, how far down should we adjust our survey data? So realistically, probably as low as 95 or up to 99% is the threshold we would adjust above. Um, the problem with going too far down is then you're throwing away survey data, which is quite valuable. Um, but the problem of not adjusting far enough down the distribution is you still have that issue of under-reporting we wouldn't be combating. Then the other thing is the width of the quantile groups. So when we have a number of quantile groups above the threshold, um, realistically, we'll probably use one of these three widths of 0.25 up to 1%. Um, if you have a smaller width, you can get, and get more precision at the top of the data set. However, when we've got a data set of 5,000 individuals, if you go below 0.25%, then you're only adjusting five or so individuals, so it becomes um, problematic accuracy-wise. And then, as um, discussed, we've got two different methods, and we've not decided on what is the ideal method to use, whether to use the quantile method or to reweigh, um, so to combat undercoverage. Um, and then one other problem is this, as I discussed, about projected data versus the full data, um, where will we go back and adjust what we've adjusted? So if we've adjusted something in two years' time, will we go back and readjust it with the full data set? Um, okay, so then we looked at, we've implemented this top income adjustment and provisionally, and then what is the effect of this top income adjustment in our headline measures in the effects of taxes and benefits, which is our survey data set. So whatever we do, we see a large change in the measures of inequality and a large increase in the income of the top um, decile, regardless of kind of the details and mechanics of the adjustment. And this variation by adjustment type is smaller than just having adjustment at all, but we still need to explore more to know what the best methods are. So this is the Gini coefficient, where if the Gini goes up, um, that indicates that income inequality is more unequal, and if it goes down, less unequal. So the, um, the dark blue line at the bottom is our unadjusted, what we like normally produce as our headline measure for Gini of disposable income. And then the other five lines 
our, our genie when we've adjusted using the quantile method, but varying thresholds. So as we can see, the variation in the genie um, by the different methods with different thresholds doesn't change as much compared to just having any adjustment in place at all, which shows us that the most important thing is that we have an adjustment in place, and then beyond that, the mechanics of the adjustment aren't as important as just having one in the first place. Um, the gray, sorry, the green dashed line is the adjusting just above 99%, and it seems that when we go down to 98%, there isn't much variation, um, there isn't much change in the genie beyond that, so it seems adjusting below the top 2% probably um, won't be necessary. Quick thing to note, the gap I discussed is because we don't have any um, SBI data sets for 2008, 2009, um, and then we see very little gap um, in 2010-11 between the tax data set and the survey data set, which is, um, we think, probably due to there was the introduction of the 50p tax that year, so a lot of individuals would have forestalled their income for the previous tax year um, to pay reduced tax, and hence, um, that year, the tax data set wouldn't vary as much from the survey data set as in other years. Um, so then we've got a couple of other charts, which is exploring um, the genie um, by different um, details of our adjustment. So this is when we use different quantile group sizes um, above the threshold using the quantile method. Um, again, whatever method we use, we see a far bigger change in inequality than um, kind of the different methods of adjustment. So we don't see any big differences depending on what quantile group size we use above the threshold. And then the final one is um, our adjustment method. So the two different methods I talked us through earlier. Um, we've had the reweighting method still provisional as we've had some problems getting the reweighting totals correct and we've only got it back to 2011-12. Um, this seems to have the biggest difference between adjustment types compared to changing the threshold or changing the quantile group size. So I think the biggest decision with our adjustment is going to be, should we do the reweighting method or the quantile method? Um, then moving away from the genie, this is um, the unadjusted, the dark blue line, compared to having a top income adjustment with the brown line, and this is the average disposable income of the top decile. So um, as you can see, there's a big increase in the average disposable income of the top decile when we adjust. Um, and then one final thing is previously using survey data, we weren't happy um, kind of presenting results on the top 1% because we knew there were issues of underreporting. Um, so we weren't happy with the accuracy of using, producing figures using the very top income individuals. Um, now we're more confident if we use this adjustment of presenting um, analysis showing income shares at the top 1%, which seems to be around 7% um, in the UK at the moment. And then I hand over to Peter, who's going to talk us through the effects of using this new adjustment on DWP's data. Thanks, Martin. So um, I'm going to show this chart. So basically, um, there's, there's, there's four lines on this chart. You probably won't be able to spot the fourth one. But uh, um, so the, the, the dark blue line is, is the series you've seen before our published uh, inequality statistics. Um, and then the yellow line is Martin's quantile method with a 97% threshold and a 0.5% width. And you can see it goes up faster in the mid-2000s and is generally higher than the published series all the way through. However, the, the orange line is if I just move from my projected to the outturn SPI data. And you can see that is pretty close to the yellow line. So changing the method to the more precise method is about the same difference as, as, as going from the projected to the outturn data. And the grey line is the last two years where the quantile method is, um, is, used, is using the projected SPI. And again, it's about the same as, as my method. So it seems that, um, I suppose, one, the story doesn't really change with whatever method you use, increasing in the mid-2000s, decreasing uh, after 10-11. Um, but it looks like the two key the, the key driver is is the SPI data being of, being available. So I think there might be a bit of trying to persuade HMRC to to think about how they're projecting this information. Um, so yes, I've said that as so the trends are less affected. And then I suppose the the, the the excellent thing about this is once we do an adjusted method on both series, we get a sort of 
even though obviously they're two totally two different total different samples, so you wouldn't expect them to be aligning. They do tell a similar story. So we can see uh, 2002 to 45 sort of level inequality rising between 45 and 67, then sort of stableish from 11, 12 onwards. Whereas before we've had sort of slightly contradictory stories with um, ONS showing a declining over time, broadly speaking, since 5, 6, and us showing sort of more sort of up and down series. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to Martin just to talk about the future outlook and then uh, we'll ask many questions. So just to sum up in terms of um, the work on this is we released an article summing this up at the end of February on the ONS website, which you can find. Um, and then we hope to publish a more comprehensive um, joint ONS DWP ESCO paper, which will hopefully also have the reweighting method in there, which we didn't have in the February release. Um, and then the plan is that we will be including a top income adjustment, adjustment in ONS's headline inequality measures and income statistics um, for the 2018-19 year. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to apply the adjustment retrospectively to a whole time series rather than have a break in our series um, come next year. Great. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I have one question myself, because the, the SPI data is at the individual level, so I didn't, like the ETB, this is still household level variable. We, we can get it to an individual level using the LCF has information on each of the individuals in the household. Okay. So then we can make it to an individual level, and then once we've done the adjustment, we then take it back to a household level, which is the same as, yes. yeah. So you carry out the adjustment on the individual level, and then you... Yeah, we'd add back on if, say, the, the head of the household was adjusted, but their partner wasn't, then we'd then add the adjusted data to the unadjusted partner's information, and that would be the household income, for instance. Okay, okay. So, so one thing that I didn't understand that well is because the underlying data source, the HBAI, so the basis is the FRS. So in between that, there's also a lot of imputation made. So for me as an end user, it's really, really hard to understand exactly what has been done there. So the WDP method has been carried out straight on the HBAI method or data? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So okay. Yeah, the, the, the FRS data is you've got adjusted, it's just the survey data. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Yes. Um, yeah, one thing um, was that, so you make uh, adjustments at the very top and then use the Gini index to compare how much do things actually change. But uh, isn't it a bit odd to use the gene index, which is most sensitive to changes in the middle of the distribution, and is known not to react so strongly when you change the tails in the distribution? Don't you think that you should also have some other measures to really show what the differences? Because you make the adjustments mechanically at the top. So that's just a question. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, sort of our, our main measures are we publish are the, the genie, the 90-10, which isn't so affected, the median and sort of thresholds of median. So I suppose the genie, you're right, isn't, isn't, is, is the worst affected of our headline measures, but isn't, maybe we should be looking at other, other inequality measures that are more sensitive to the top as well as the, the paper in the, in the summer is having that, that good feedback. We have done some analysis on the S80, S20, which I think is more sensitive to the top, and that's so similar trends in terms of increases to the genie. So, but we would include that in the full paper, I hope. Um, Richard Dorset, University of Westminster. Is there a, an assumption in this that the, the adjustment is addressing an underreporting of income rather than the fact that the people observed to have the highest incomes in the survey data are different from the people that have the, you know, a non-response issue rather than a, a misreporting issue? And if so, you know, what is the, um, beyond, beyond giving these headline figures on, on um, trends in Gini indices and so forth, is there an ambition to be able to treat these imputed data or adjusted outcome data as if they're actual true measures of, of uh, income? 
Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's what, we, what we've done is replace their income information. We've assumed there are other characteristics, such as household composition, um, you know, age and stuff like that, but haven't been adjusted. So if, there's like, yeah, if, if we've just got a wrong sample of the top percentage with whatever we do here is, is, isn't so good. Um, but that, you know, that's, that's, what we've, what we've, well, that's what we've chosen to do, unfortunately. That, that's, that's, yeah. And obviously, if we, if we are missing a huge tranche of differently constituted rich people, well, we've got no information about them anyway to, to, to be rescaling or, or regrossing. Just to build on that last point. Uh, just to, uh, sorry, Richard Tonkin, ONS, one of the uh, co-authors, but uh, just to build on that last point, no, uh, the work that Stephen Jenkins has done with uh, uh, Richard Burkhauser and others looking at the top of the income distribution in the UK has suggested that the uh, kind of issue is mainly around under-reporting, uh, uh, so that uh, kind of, uh, the survey is capturing the right people, kind of, although there's still going to be issues around sparsity of data and so on, but... Uh, those people are under-reporting their incomes, and that's a, a kind of hurt, a bigger issue than non-response. So I think there's one more question at the back. Yeah. Maybe. So I think it's, 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 it's to correct for the survey. So basically, if you imagine one year, some very rich person fills in the survey, sort of, you know, just, just coincidentally, but the next year, he, that one rich person says, we've sampled, says no. Well, suddenly the means jumped up just because that person, that, that one case is on the data set. So that, that's the issue right at the top of the distribution. If you've got sort of, you know, a billionaire, for instance, filling in the survey one year, and you don't adjust the top, well, that, that, that spurious volatility, it's, it's just that you, you sampled in this year, you didn't sample in the previous year or the next year. And hopefully that would that would be in the SPI data. That that you know the fact that you know if that if that business is dominating the UK economy, that should be then driving some of the SPI trends. Whereas, you know, you don't want the random sample to, to drive some of the trends, which is what what it would do without this this adjustment. One question, yes. Uh, yeah, it just kind of follows. I know when I'm working on a, admin, a pure admin-based um, income series, I think that's maybe that's where you have to, to, to go rather than, because you know, you've, you've got two kind of untidy data sets you're trying to merge together to get something, and I suppose if you're, correct, you're correcting one with the other, but then you're correcting the other one as well, it, it gets a bit messy, so I think maybe that's a, that, that's a, a more fruitful kind of area there. Okay, we have time maybe for one more question, if there is any. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>
Yep. Okay. So my name is Sane Ohms. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford. I'm an economist by training at the Department of Social Policy and Intervention and the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Uh, so I, the research question I've been asking uh, in my research is what is the effect of capital incomes on overall inequality in the UK? So to give a brief outline of my presentation, uh, first I will give the motivation for why I study this question, then look at the UK inequality indicators, but actually a lot of the groundwork has already been laid out for me by this, at this point. I will look at the implications for capital incomes in the existing UK top income corrections. I propose an, an extension to the, to the existing methods and then suggest that we might need to rethink the UK capital income narrative. Uh, so, in the academic literature, the, the let me start here. In the academic literature, the mainly the the studies using household surveys find uh, little effect of capital incomes on inequality in the UK, while the fiscal sources have reported modest surges in capital incomes uh, at the top of the of the distribution over the past years. So then, the key question for me was: To what extent do our standard inequality indicators? Uh, along the lines that you've just seen, adequately pick up recent surges in capital incomes. So for my analysis, I've used the FRIs because this is the basis of the Department for Work and Pension Top Income Correction. Um, so I took the aggregate amount of capital income that I found in the FRIs and I divided that by the aggregate amount of capital income found in a survey for personal income. And what I see is uh, over the past years is a decline of 30 percentage points of 33 percentage points over the past years, which is quite a big decline. One thing that is important to mention here that I don't find this for other income sources in the survey, so this problem is particular to capital incomes. So if we look at the very last year, 2015, um, we are only capturing a quarter of total capital incomes compared to the fiscal data. So one of the questions that was asked previously is about the dividend forestalling. So there's some of this effect taking place that through the tax system in some years, more, more, more capital income is reported. However, that would not justify the entire trend, but this is definitely presented in the statistics or present in the statistics. Uh, again, the SPI is still a lower bound because of tax avoidance, tax evasion. We do not measure capital, in, uh, capital gains and other types of um, capital incomes not taxed at the source. So then the next question is like, to what extent do we observe this pattern across the entire distribution? So we do observe a similar pattern across the entire distribution. We also see that the underestimation grows as we move up the capital income distribution, and especially the capture of the very, very top has fallen even below 10% in the past years. Uh, so then, for the purpose of my presentation, I had to highlight the two major inequality statistics used, but these have, in the previous presentation, been elaborated on in a bit more detail, so I will skip this slide for now. Like The main implication of the top income adjustment is at least in terms of the academic narrative that it has been picking up better the, the, the story of wage growth. So then, what is the implication for capital incomes in both the, the series as they are now? Um, so I'm very interested in, in hearing all of the developments that are taking place at the ONS as well. So at least in the, um, uh, in, in the ONS statistics at, as they are currently published on the website, you would find very little effect of capital incomes on overall inequality. Uh, because capital incomes are very concentrated towards the top of the distribution, um, they are not expected to be picked up because of errors in the survey and sampling design. So we overall, the, the big decline that, we, that I just presented to you, we do not expect that these statistics are ad adequately dealing with this problem. So then uh, the, uh, the Department for Work and Pension Statistics. So at, at present, the top income correction is applied to total income. Uh, then from an academic perspective, the series is not decomposable, so we're not able to draw a conclusion on to what extent different income components are contributing the, to the inequality story. Um, as we've seen in the previous slide, is that the underestimation of capital income also starts below the eligibility thresholds as the one currently used by the government. Um, then again, the UK fiscal unit is the individual level, so I wanted to stay as close, as close to the source as possible, so I have carried out my, 
My analysis uh, for gross in income at the individual le level rather than the household disposable income measures that are at present adopted. Um, so then also what you've seen in the previous presentation is that this method has recently, recently faced some critique from the academic com community and clearly they have picked up on that and they have been working with the academics that have been proposing these new series. So I will skip this for now. <laughs> I think maybe good to mention, like go a little bit deeper into the SPI2 adjustment, the one that has been proposed by, by Burkhauser et al. So the, uh, a big difference between the Department for Work and Pension and the SPI2 adjustment um, is that these researchers, they replace cell means um, based on population groups of 0.1%. So let's say if you would correct for the top 5%, this would consist of 50 different imputations for uh, 50 different 0.1% groups within the eligibility threshold. So that is one of the main differences. Uh, and also their imputation only works through replacement of cell means and does not do that much to correct for the, um, for the weights. So then what I did is I tried to replicate the series. <laughs> uh, you've seen the underlying details from the previous author, so I will skip this slide as well. Um, oh, that's a pity. So my main results fell out. Um, so what you've seen, like this table presents, um, so after carrying out replicating these series, uh, I have tried to do this per income component. In this, I've tried to, I had to assume equal income composition. So then what you see, uh, this is the table of how much capital income the different series pick, pick up over time. Uh, if I remember correctly, out of the top of my head, over the, the entire period, the FRS misses 60% of all of their capital income, the W. The WP method um, misses 40% and the SPI2 around 26% on the top of my head. So then what I try to do is given the fact that we know that these statistics are currently underestimating capital income, what can we do about it? Uh, so what I decided to do is to apply my methods, my, my, my proposed extensions to the SPI2 adjustment to, to uh, make my results more in line with the methodological literature. Uh, again, what I was saying, I assume the equal income, income composition to allow for decomposition for now as a first exercise. Uh, and then I apply the income correction into stages, which I will elaborate on now. Uh, so first of all, the stage one is I try to place more, high, more weight on high capital share individuals. <coughs> So in the SPI 1-2 SPI methods, as I just explained, this is applied to 0.1 percentage uh, income groups. So within each of these income groups, I calculated the average capital share. And then I had a look uh, at the, I identified the individuals in both the FRS and SPI that are above the, this, this, um, this average capital share. So then I found, find that actually the composition at the very top is very different between different databases. So in the FRS, on average, at, in, the, in the top bin, for example, the J1, we find that only 4% is classified as high capital income individual, and in the SPI, 34%. Uh, so the ratio of high capital share individuals um, is 14. So that, that means that the SPI captures 14 times as much high capital share individuals uh, compared to the FRS. So what I did uh, for, for the first stage of this adjustment is try to scale up the weights of the people that have high capital shares um, in the FRS to be more in line with SPI. And then I found these results. So the first two columns show the results for the previous series. The third and fourth column uh, show the results of, oh, uh, for my series. So Basically, the, the additional adjustment in the weight increases the, the unadjust, uh, the adjusted average uh, on average 10% for both series. We still expect part of the capital income not to be picked up by these series because the underestimation starts further down the distribution. So you can make different allocation assumptions on this. Uh, like the most neutral assumption to make and which I will present today is a proportion of the allocation. So you scale up all of the people with capital income uh, to reduce the gap to zero. Then I made a very upper bound assumption, which is not completely in line with the findings we found, found before, but just to show you how the results would hold up against that upper bound estimate. Uh, 
Uh, so for the upper route estimate, we allocate the, the remaining 17 or 6 percent, depending on the, uh, on the eligibility threshold, uh, to, the, to the people that are also eligible for the topping income correction. And these are the results. So we find very, the, the first four lines, they are uh, the Gini coefficients as seen in the previous exercise. Then we find that it doesn't matter too much um, the, um, which extension we make, but overall we do see that the, uh, by imputing all of the capital incomes that the Gini coefficient increases. And again, I think some of the increases that we see here are largely driven uh, by changes in the, that have taken place in the, uh, in the tax uh, base, which I'm not sure at this stage how to deal with that because I haven't seen other countries dealing with this problem so far. Um, yeah. So I think, um, so <laughs> from, an ap from an academic perspective, this is the first attempt to carry out factor decomposition on top adjusted series. And again, the, the results vary um, depending on the assumptions. So the assumptions, they are, they matter more for, for this variable than for overall inequality. Um, but what I would say is that overall, I think that the effect of capital incomes on inequality is higher, thanks, higher than the current academic and I guess policy debates suggest today. <laughs> um, yeah, so the dotted line is the, the, the replicating the, the series for the Department of Work and Pension. The dashed lines are the five and 10% SPI2 corrections. And then my adjustments are the ones that fluctuate around. And then the upper bound estimate is the, is the highest. <laughs> so then, as conclusion, overall, I would say that the UK capital income narrative changes from low to moderate and increasing effect on overall inequality. I presented the first results for top adjusted factor decomposition. However, I would like to have some more inputs uh, from people that are more experts on these methods to figure out which of these statistics is best to present to larger audiences. And then, there's clearly still some limitations and ideas that need to be, de be developed further in future research, which is, for example, the assumption of equal income composition, the arbitrariness of the cutoff point. Uh, for policy purpose, we would be more interested in household disposable income rather than individual gross income. The fiscal data is still a lower bound, so what we were also discussing earlier, to what extent do we want to impute other forms of capital income, such as capital incomes retained in the corporate sector? And again, I found this, uh, the, 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 the 33 percentage um, point decrease in capital income capture by the household surveys quite striking. So one of the main questions is to what extent do we observe similar patterns in other countries? So this was my presentation. Thank you. So any questions from the audience? <laughs> so this is a bit of a cheeky question, given it's, it's one of the servers I'm responsible for. But yeah. is, there, is, there, is there anything that's changed over time? Sort of, that's, you, know, you see like this sort of downward trend in terms of reporting of capital income. Is there any kind of things from your, your experience that you think might be driving it that we could try and that is new. So I think like the capital income has very different drivers, and it's much more sensitive to changes in the tax code um, than than wage income. So I think really the main implication is that. I think this is also driving the previous question. So I think if you have all of a sudden these fluctuations, you should really be thinking like, to what extent is this a real change? Or to what extent are these things that we are importing from the tax system? Yeah. Hi, uh, I think I've introduced myself before, but Andy Summers, um, LSE. Um, yeah, I think this is like really brilliant. Um, work I, mean, I I'm I've come at this from a slightly different perspective and haven't really thought so much about what's going on in the surveys so um, I've been thinking about what's missing from the um, SPI data particularly in the form of capital income and, and basically the answer to that in summary is everything that's not subject to income tax is not included in the SPI and so in the context of capital income you know think about all of ISA income, which has increased since 2008 from 300 billion to 600 billion in income, uh, ISA savings, so savings oh, yeah. in individual yeah, yeah, savings yeah. accounts, um, which is an interesting one because maybe that actually might plausibly be a little bit 
better captured in the surveys, yeah. and it, whereas it isn't captured at all in the SPI. Yeah. Um, but there'll be lots of other forms of capital income not captured in the tax data, such as um, foreign source income of of uh, non-domiciled individuals in the UK, for example. But uh, I guess the main point was was just to say it's r it's really great to try and also work out what's going on in the survey data because I had no impression of that before. So, yeah, thanks. Oh, well, thank you. What I do want to say that in my broader research is driven by the, the phenomenon that you just described. So right now, like the, this part of my research is embedded within the household survey literature, but I have also looked at the phenomenon that you've been discussing, so I would like to have a chat about that. Also in the SPI, I think that like one of the problems, in at least in the public tape that I've been using, that they have the, this measure of the other investment income, and I think, they, I think they make some sort of imputations there for ISAs, but because you are not able to disentangle this income at all, I don't know what is happening. Um, but I just wanted to say, I think I forgot to mention that, so most of the, 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 the trends here that is driving this is dividend income. So like it's still other investment income is just a super small, tiny part of everything that I just described. Uh, I had just one follow-up on that, actually, to remind us why. Dividend income. Cause, um, so dividend income, in some cases, presents a bit of a difficulty in defining or distinguishing capital income from labour income because one of the things that's happened in the UK is a shift towards more owner-managed businesses yeah. where the owner might well be receiving most of their remuneration in the form of dividends. But if we could really get at that, which is really difficult to do, we'd probably ideally want to say some of that's a return on their labour and some of it's a return on um, capital. Um, but I guess at the moment we're forced to treat all of that as capital income. Yeah, so this is what I did in, in my research right now. But again, I have very similar questions. So I think we should maybe discuss this in more detail in the break. Um, yeah, but thank you very much. Yeah. OK, if there's no more questions, and I'm also chair, then I think I would like to uh, have an a round of applause for all the speakers today <laughs> to end the session. Uh, thank you much. Thank you very much for for attending, and I hope you enjoyed the session.
Yeah. Okay. Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, panel discussion on priorities to, to the new system of national accounts. Uh, for those of you who do not yet know me, I would say, my name is Peter van der Ven. I'm a head of national accounts at the OECD. Uh, let me first start by introducing uh, the panel. It's, uh, first we have Jonathan Haskell from the Bank of England nowadays. Uh, Joe Grice from the Office for National Statistics, Kevin Fox, University of New South Wales, and uh, Dennis Fixler from uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the US. So you see it's a very diverse panel. We have two from, from, from England, one from uh, uh, Australia and one from uh, the US. We have two from the compiling community, two from the user community. I think gender-wise, there's not truly <laughs> a diverse community. I'm sorry for that. Uh, but uh, by way of introduction to the panel discussion, uh, national accounts, and I think most of you will know it, are compiled according to international standards. And uh, the current, current Bible, or the current holy book for, for national accounts, is the 2008 system of national accounts, the 2008 SNA. And actually, you have a, an equivalent or, or uh, an European equivalent, which is called the European System of Accounts 2010, uh, which is almost uh, in or fully aligned to, to the 2008 SNA, but there's an important uh, distinction. In Europe, it's, it's a law. You have to apply it as a national accountant. Uh, very little on the history. The first set of international standards on national accounts was in 1953. We had an update in 1968, and then we had an update in 1993, and the latest version is the 2008 uh, SNA. So it's approximately every 15 or 25 years <coughs> that we tend to, to have an update of the SNA. Uh, I, I, I should say that, that national accountants do not get particularly thrilled about having an update of the international <laughs> standards. Uh, but but it, is, it is a massive investment. And uh, I, if you take into account uh, the, the, the calculation of new consistent time series, all the benchmark revisions you have to make, I think worldwide you're easily talking about hundreds of million dollars that the, of, of resources that are involved in it. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a massive investment, <coughs> but it's also fair to say that uh, I what Rebecca Riley uh, said yesterday, that GDP depreciates. I would say it becomes, uh, becomes obsolete, but it, de it definitely uh, depreciates. Uh, we see, <coughs> since the, the we have the SNA 2008, new developments like the digitalization, uh, global production arrangements, including tax minimization, using uh, intangible assets, which can be easily moved uh, across countries. We also see user, uh, changes in user demands. Um, since the 2008-2010 the, the economic and financial crisis, we, we have noticed a higher demand for data on monitoring financial risks and vulnerabilities, interconnectedness. We see uh, an increased demand for uh, environmental issues, distribution, which we also had a session. Uh, so, and I should say national accounts may be perceived as, as a quite perhaps sometimes as a, a conservative or a defensive group of people, they are, they are really aware of these developments. And uh, lots of discussions take place on how to deal uh, with them. And also, sometimes it starts to itch too much. And you think, well, should we or shouldn't we have an update of these international standards? And I think that, that the tipping point has, has been reached uh, 
for two reasons in 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 in, in recent uh, for two reasons in recent years one is the impact global production arrangements can have and uh, the impact it can have on GDP measurement and the Irish case is the example, is the example, raised a lot of discussion also within the national accounts community, not only in the user community, where they sometimes said this is uh, Alan's in, in Wonderland economics or something like that, uh, but also the digital economy, free services, the role of data, accounting for data. So. At the international level, it has now been decided to, to set up three task teams who will take forward the research agenda of the 2008 SNA. And these, uh, each, these, e this, each of these uh, task teams will take on one priority area. And the three priority areas is one is digitalization, two is globalization, and three is sustainability and well-being. Uh, well, so we are lo lots, lots of discussion on globalization, digitalization. If you look at sustainability and well-being, it's perhaps looking at a broader framework of national accounts, which go beyond the traditional set of economic accounts. <coughs> Each of these task teams will produce guidance notes in, in, in this year or in the next year, and uh, which provide additional uh, clarifications and interpretations in relation to the three priority areas, but they will also look at issues which go beyond the current international standards and which may require an update and, and revision of the standards. So anyhow, we will have an extensive user consultation on these guidance notes and uh, they will also provide these, these guidance notes to provide input to a discussion on whether we or not we should actually have such an uh, update. Um, that's by way of introduction, and uh, I will ask, well, there is ma one main question I asked the panelists, and that is, w what do you consider the main challenges to the current uh, system of national accounts, and what are the priorities for uh, moving forward in relation to, to, the, these, to the system of national accounts? And each panelist, I will give five minutes to make to make a first statement. I will be very strict on those five minutes, uh, and then I will turn to you. So prepare your questions, because I, I want to have a more interactive uh, panel discussion. At the end, depending on time, uh, I will give the panelists uh, a couple of minutes to respond to the questions and the ideas being put forward. So. Uh, the order is as the people sit here, so I first turn to uh, Jonathan Haskell. He has a couple of slides, so he comes well prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, thank, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, this microphone working. Can I just hold the microphone, please? Maybe, yeah. maybe that's easy. Uh, th thank you, Peter, and thank you to the organisers uh, for not only organising this session, um, but such a good conference, which I've enjoyed enormously uh, so far. Uh, so here's some comments. As Peter says, I've recently moved to the Bank of England. These are my personal opinion, not the opinion of, uh, of anybody else. Um, so there's lots of public interest in GDP. Um, everybody's familiar with Diane Coyle's book, and I think Diane would, would have loved to have been here, but uh, uh, couldn't be uh, here because she's traveling. Um, and since, and uh, uh, um, Charlie Bean's report, uh, about GDP, which came uh, soon afterwards. Uh, and then David Pilling wrote a book last year on the growth delusion, my favorite quote of which is on the right there. The invention of GDP has given rise to a class of technocrats and economists, boo hiss, who implement policy for the good of the economy, but not always for the good of the rest of us. So most people in the room fall into the class of either those types of people who David Pilling doesn't like, or people who are producing the GDP, Peter, and various other people like that, um, which is kind of even worse. Uh, since. <laughs> I, I, I don't produce it anymore. <laughs> um, now, since then, so the latest addition to the canon uh, is this new book by Michael Blastland called The Hidden Half, and it's cun cun cunningly folded over, How the World Conceals Its Secrets. And it's sort of about the basically, it's the idea that there's a lot of, s lot of noise in data and there's a lot of signal in the noise. Um, and it's full, of, um, it's full of good stuff. Uh, and in particular, it's full of a graph here of the revision triangles for GDP, uh, making the point that the early estimates 
of GDP in uh, in this particular quarter here in the Great Recession quarter was 0.2, and then they were successively revised down, and then they were revised back up again. So there's a lot of discussion which continues about the kind of public legitimacy of GDP, and I'd like to come back to that in just in just a second. Uh, in the meantime, um, of course, if we look at Price Waterhouse Coopers, who produce every year a report on companies and the top companies by capitalization, we see a familiar list of companies, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Alibaba, people like that. These are all companies whose assets, in my humble opinion, are intangible assets. So as Peter measured, uh, as Peter mentioned kindly, uh, this is where I come from. I think it's very helpful. If you want to understand the digital economy, we need to understand these types of intangible assets. But we've got lots of sessions about that, Peter, so I won't dwell on uh, these companies, of course, are selling goods which have these kind of prices involved. So here are various ICT prices of computers, communications equipment, and so forth. And you can see these incredibly fast declining prices. So over to the price measurement people, uh, the kind of complement of the intangible investment is over to the price measurement people uh, to try to get all these prices right. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Dave Byrne and Carl Car uh, Carrado's work. Dave is sitting over there. Uh, we're indebted, of course, to Dennis, who's worked on these data as well. And then Kevin is uh, going to tell us about the prices of, of even more digital goods uh, in the future um, as well. So all of that is on the kind of price side of things. Now, Peter mentioned Ireland. So I've got a slide about Ireland that was put together whilst you were speaking, Peter. So there you go. Um, <laughs> and one of the points about Ireland, it seems to me, or well, a couple of points about Ireland, which I think are important. One is, one is on the in intangible side. So here is our Irish GFCF uh, gross domestic fi fixed capital formation. Uh, and you can see that they've got a column here. They report a time series of intangible assets excluding R&D imports. So in 20, well, I can't see in my glasses, 2017, that was about uh, seven and a half billion euros. If you then go over to the far right and include the imports, you get 21 billion euros, three times the amount is the importing of your, is the importing of R and D services? So if we're going to do this stuff about intangibles and get all the prices right and this that and the other, we have to face up to the type of ownership difficulties which Peter and the various other committees um, uh, look at. And these ownership difficulties immediately get you into the problem that, of course, cross border, um, you get these very very large effects. They're so big that in Ireland, as you can see, they report them separately. That's the first point. Uh, even if you didn't like intangibles and this, that, and the other, and you just wanted to say something about tangibles, you've still got an interesting problem, or to me, an interesting problem. Here's the Irish column here for machinery and equipment excluding aircraft leasing. You get a number like 10 billion. If you include uh, aircraft le leasing, <coughs> you get a number like 6.5 billion. So there's an enormous amount of apparent GFCF in Ireland, which is related to the transfer of aircraft. Now, um, any of you who've sort of talked to any business people in Ireland will know that it's all related to the ownership type of issues. The Irish have this very well-developed system whereby they lease aircraft on long-term uh, financial uh, leases. Um, in fact, it's so well-developed that each aircraft is typically its own company. Um, uh, with no employees, of course, as well. So that makes it ma that makes it additionally um, much harder. So uh, now, what that means is a lot of these aircraft go across borders. So if you look in the UK, here's UK investment uh, in in in, um, in well, just all investment relative to the G7. You can see that it's been going down. If you take out aircraft at the very end, you can see that it hasn't been going down quite so much. So this is all very big bananas, and there's a big set of measurement issues around here. Since I have one minute, I'm going to tell you my final wish list, um, just on this very last slide here, um, about uh, now, now that I sit at the bank, about what we'd like uh, GDP uh, to do and uh, some of the issues around the SNA. The first is around issues of timeliness. Uh, obviously, if you're a policymaker, what you need is you need timely information. Um, the fast indicators of GDP um, are, ex I think, extremely valuable. And I think that's very important and one area uh, where I don't know whether that's an SNA question, Peter, um, but I think that's a very important question for policymakers. The second is around inventories, a kind of forgotten corner, it seems to me, of many national income, national income accounts and capital and all of that. But they turn out to be terribly important, especially when you think about um, adjustments to shocks and so forth. Um, next question, uh, next issue is around kind of interconnectedness. 
and I enjoyed very much uh, Vasco Cavallo's lecture uh, earlier on. Uh, and it seems to me that there are two issues that are there. What he talked about, about the input output tables and all of that brings that all to life. And the credit flows and the financial flows, those are important as well. A pet peeve of mine is around self-employment. Self-employment in the UK is about 15, 1, 5 percent of the workforce. That's very big bananas. We need to sort of fit that. It doesn't fit many of the conventional headings. Uh, that's kind of important. Um, I have to mention Brexit. We've been going for uh, at least four minutes and nobody said anything about Brexit, so I have to mention Brexit. And, and here the issues of trade as asymmetries um, are very important if one wants to figure those kind of things out. Uh, finally, on public trust um, and legitimacy. Uh, let me just spend a minute on, on this. So if, if, so 30 <laughs> seconds on this, sorry. Um, public trust and legitimacy. So one thing you say about in, when you think about monetary policy is Gresham's law, which is the notion, of course, that bad money drives out good. Seems to me a question that you could ask the same question about statistics. Do bad statistics drive out good? And does that mean that the public legitimacy of statistical bureaus producing GDP and others then becomes questioned as there's lots of, uh, as a lot, lots of competition? I think we need to think really hard uh, about, about the role of the Statistics Bureau in that case. And I think it means that trust in the Statistics Bureau and trust in what it is that the, the Statistics Bureaus do becomes incredibly important. Uh, otherwise, we don't want to suffer from Gresham's Law. I'm sorry to go over time, but thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Joe. Well, thank you very much. Um, it struck me when I had this opportunity, Peter, it's a bit like Christmas wish list, but it's better with a Christmas wish list, you have to uh, post it off to Finland or send it up the chimney. But if you've got Father Christmas actually sitting next to you, he has to, has to listen to what you say. So, so it's an unparalleled opportunity. Um, I had three items on my wish list, or three groups of items at least. Uh, the one is what I'd call the kind of continuity items. And those are the things which actually the National Accounting Fraternity have been talking about for uh, some little while. If you think about some of these things we talk about in this context, globalization, uh, new business models, and so on, they've actually been around for a surprisingly long time. I mean, globalization on any objective measure took place around about the turn of the century. And in some ways, it's surprising that the, the, the Irish catastrophe, or one might call it that, actually took so long to emerge. It could have been any country, almost any, anywhere in the world who had those kind of issues. Uh, the new business models, well, clearly they had to exist. But after all, I mean, Danny Quar and others were talking about the weightless economy in the 1990s, so we should at least have been warned that uh, this was the way that things were going. Uh, the service economy, uh, someone said yesterday, uh, presents particular issues. But actually, in the UK, uh, the service sector uh, exceeded the production sector by way of size uh, in 1950 for the first time. It's hardly as if services are a new phenomenon in our economies. Uh, and actually, just from my particular kind of personal experience and background, one uh, uh, agenda that seems to be very important here to continue is with public service um, uh, productivity and measurement. Uh, public services typically <coughs> account for a fifth to a quarter of our economies, uh, much larger than manufacturing, and we, we ignore that as our peril. So I think these are items which we haven't cracked. They've been around for a while, but I think uh, the SNA would be wise to continue to, to work on them. Now, the kind of the two new items, the first, um, what I'd call the missing capitals, when I, well, I don't call it the missing capitals, uh, Amartya Sen and Partha Dasgupta have been calling them the missing capitals for, again, uh, a decade or two or more. Uh, these are the items which seem to be particularly relevant to explaining economic experience, certainly social experience, but not included in the traditional national accounts. Uh, one of these, I think actually there's a bit of a cottage industry in identifying the OECDs up to about 13 or 14. I wouldn't want to concentrate on 13 or 14, but I think there are two or three which are particularly important. Uh, one of these, close to my heart, is natural capital, where I think all of the uh, attention given to um, uh, the state of uh, nature's assets, uh, the extent to which those assets are being used for good or evil, uh, good or bad at least, is, um, is important. A lot of work's been done uh, on that. The first um, uh, economic system of uh, environmental and economic accounts uh, dates back to 1993, but we now are at a position where that work is coming to fruition in a number of countries, and we need to think quite hard about how that is going to play into the overall framework. Uh, similarly, I think a little bit behind that, perhaps in some ways, but similarly important, is human capital. 
and how that plays into a proper uh, description and narrative about the state of our economies, their sustainability. If we are in a world where expertise and know-how becomes increasingly important, then human capital is inevitably going to be increasingly important. Uh, then also um, intangibles, which I don't need to talk about. Jonathan's already mentioned that. Uh, intangible capital, um, uh, increasingly important relevant to um, uh, physical capital. Arguably social capital, I have less strong feelings about that in this context. The important point about all of these uh, missing capitals is that they, have a, they fit very well with the national accounts framework. Uh, in particular, the fact that you can structure them along the lines of integrated stock flow accounts, stocks telling you something about sustainability and the state of the world, and flows telling you about the stock, the, the flow of benefits that you're getting from sweating those assets, I think is, is very important and would make, if we can uh, find ways of systematizing this kind of work into the overall uh, system of national accounts or alongside it, would enrich uh, the, um, the discussion and the policy debate about these areas. Then the final group, I think uh, the wider measures of welfare, Jonathan's already mentioned this. Two aspects I think are important for me. Uh, the one is, as Charlie Bean's report showed, a lot of the issues arise because of issues of the porousness of the production frontier, that new technologies which uh, uh, used to be done in the household sector are now done in the commercial sector, in the market sector, and vice versa. Uh, now, it seems to me the way around this is to start to work on what household production really looks like and really means, and how it can be properly and systematically described. We've got an enormous starting point for that because uh, Gary Becker set out the economics of it about uh, 50 years ago, so we don't need to start from scratch, but working out how, how that framework would look would be important. Um, then the other aspect of this, I think, is um, getting some discipline into the, um, what I think has been called the Wild West of this state of studies about wider uh, measures of well-being and welfare. Uh, all sorts of studies arrive with all sorts of methodologies, sometimes with consumer surplus in, sometimes not. Uh, various domains proclaimed. It really does look like the Wild West. So I think this is an area where actually uh, the, um, the, the national accounting fraternity, the statistical community, really can uh, establish some value by beginning to work out what is the right way to approach these issues more systematically in the past. So my final plea, Peter, is uh, having characterized you as Father Christmas in the first instance, if you'd also like to be Wyatt Herp, then you can kind of sort out this statistical Dodge City, which I think has emerged in this area. Thanks. Oh, actually, oh, sorry, one second. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Uh, actually, I won't take the mic. I'm going to trust that the lapel mic is working. Can no. people hear me okay? No, no, yeah, no, I don't want to double up. Back. Don't want to double up on capital input here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks. Uh, I'd just like to start by saying land. Um, I don't think, know if anyone else will say land, so land. Uh, say it again. Uh, I'm just saying that in case I forget to mention it later. I'll, hopefully I'll come back to that. Um, first, GDP is a very successful product. Okay. Now, Peter will immediately say, well, we're talking about the system of national accounts, which is more than just GDP. But it's obvious, often treated as being synonymous, and that's a sign of the success of GDP. How did it become so successful? By being useful. It tells us something, right? It tells us something you want to know about. And if you needed any evidence of that, you just had to look through the global financial crisis where policymakers looked to GDP. Revisions, et cetera, fine. But out of the alternatives to look at, it was still regarded as the best option. They were looking at other indicators, such as the Baltic Dry Shipping Index, et cetera. But they were more like a check to see if things are being completely mismeasured. GDP plays played and is playing a, still a, a very fundamental role in informing policy. So uh, another problem with all this is that, well, okay, we, we say GDP is not quite what we want. It, it it's never has been what we want. Really, we've been making do with it, or it's just not keeping up with the times. Um, so let's, how do we go beyond GDP? What's the next step? Unfortunately, most of the proposals around that seem to be about destroying GDP, something which we found to be quite useful. Um, now, the alternatives that are proposed often have 
problems, uh, including things like, well, how do you, what are the rules for weighting things? How do you add things up? The Human Development Index, for example, it puts equal weights on life expectancy, education, GDP per head. Why equal weights? Because, well, we don't quite know what to do. Uh, so there hasn't been the same systematization of the construction that we have for a measure like GDP. Uh, double counting is also a problem with a lot of the alternatives. Uh, so GDP is a, a very well-defined, well-developed uh, index that we find useful that avoids a lot of the problems of the alternatives. If you don't go for an index, but go for a dashboard approach, well, that, that's a possibility, the OECD Better Life Index. Uh, the New Zealand government, uh, through the New Zealand Treasury, has just launched the Living Standards Framework to try and better measure well-being. Uh, it includes things like cultural identity, which is important in New Zealand, particularly uh, around indigenous identity, Maori uh, culture. Uh, the surveys which ask people whether they're um, free to be themselves or their sense of belonging. Okay, and these are included as policy goals. The idea is GDP is not capturing people's experience. And the New Zealand Prime Minister um, at, at the World Economic Forum uh, earlier this year on a panel said, uh, titled More Than GDP, uh, said what we're about in New Zealand is about kindness kindness. So we, GDP doesn't measure kindness. And what New Zealand is trying to get towards is understanding kindness in the community. Uh, well, we have enough trouble measuring GDP. I don't quite know how we <laughs> measure uh, kindness. And many of you who are familiar perhaps with the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team and the way they play may not associate New Zealand with <laughs> kindness too much. <laughs> But, but this is uh, a new framework which has just been launched, which is going to be used to uh, assess, guide expenditure and to assess uh, the performance of the New Zealand economy, <clears throat> which uh, is an interesting initiative. I'll be interested to see how it turns out. Um, two weeks after uh, the Prime Minister was at the World Economic Forum talking about the importance of kindness, uh, I heard her on the... Um, speaking about the great GDP numbers and how it signaled that there was great policies that they had <laughs> implemented and uh, how the government was doing well. So even she was still relying on GDP. Um, so it's useful. What is the future of it? Well, what will be most useful in the future? And I think that's the, the key thing. Um, what, in what way can it adjust for the times to be most useful for the broadest number of um, purposes? Um, I want to emphasise land again. Uh, land is measured, I think, in the national accounts. I think we can do a much better uh, job of land measurement. I know Dennis has had a team trying to improve land measurement in the US, and I hope other countries will take a close look at it. It's a very fundamental asset, uh, and I think we can do better. But that can be extended, of course, to the quality of land, ecosystem services, subsoil assets, the whole UN system of environmental economic accounting. Uh, I think that's important for um, improving GDP in the, in the future. Digital economy, whether we, I think we ought to do a better job of measuring that. How we do that, um, is it in addition to GDP as uh, I'm proposing with my co-authors, that GDP is GDP, but we look at how we could extend it to uh, value free digital uh, products. Um, but something needs to be done on the digital economy. The OECD has done some work on this. They have a uh, framework, which now the Australian Bureau of Statistics has implemented as well. But that's kind of reorganizing the national accounts. It's not extending the national accounts. OK. <laughs> well, uh, uh, the ABS tell me they're not extending. They're just sort of uh, <laughs> moving things around to see, to see what's happening with the, uh, firms or activities within the digital economy. Um, intangibles, very important. And this issue of trade and IP. Um, so something needs to be done there. Uh, you know, if basically you've got, say, expenses happening in, say, the US, and the rents that are generated by that uh, appearing on a, either a Channel Island or an Ireland, and uh, so that you get this sort of mismatch of the expenses and the revenues. And if, if possible, I think perhaps a sensible thing is to try and match the... Uh, the revenues with their source expenditures, and that's the, the revenue should be allocated back to the country where the ideas uh, were developed, but that is 
uh, not an easy thing to do, I think, but I think that's something that's a, a priority to look at. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Well, it doesn't wor not work oddly. You've got it a does. loud voice. It does. But uh, it, the, the framework we have developed does include extensions to the GDP uh, boundary, the digital okay. supply and use tables. We, we do include lines for free services, free assets like uh, R and uh, Linux and okay, it also data. So but right. obviously measurement is an issue there. Yeah. So it's, an, it, it's nice to be the last since there's so much overlap between uh, uh, the interests of the statistical entities here, represented here. Um, so first topic sort of for the SNA is measurement. So we've talked about digitalization. That's certainly one that's very important to us. Um, the focus, uh, uh, I think, has been maybe too much on final demand and not enough about the transform transformative aspects of digitalization on intermediate inputs. And so there may be this, when you're looking at GDP, that the intermediate inputs may be intermediate industries may be more important than the final demand aspects of it. Uh, this gets to the importance of deflators, quality change. Uh, we're doing a, a lot of work with that. I think that the price volume aspects of uh, GDP measurement is extremely important. We, Kevin just mentioned, we, we're interested in non-produced finan financial assets, in particular land, house prices. All these things are, are, are very much linked. Um, Globalization, global value chains, uh, these are all issues that I think the SNA needs to, uh, to address uh, to be viable in the future. But I think all these things um, need to be looked at in, in the point of view of what's the measurement, what's the, what are the measurement issues? What questions do we want GDP to be able to answer? And in, in my mind, it, it, the framework has to sort of think about these sort of welfare-related issues here and, and not try to be as objective as possible and not to inject subjective dimensions into the uh, national accounts. Uh, I think that that would be a mistake, and it, it's hard to draw the, the boundary there. Which, which leads me to the, the next uh, topic that I think that too little is paid attention to. Jonathan talked about it a little bit. It's this communication strategy. We do have revisions. The revisions are not understood. I mean, I, I spent a lot of my time uh, in the previous administration talking about revisions are not errors. Uh, so this is, a, this is a very important concept. It, it's, it's explaining to users what revisions are about. It's also explaining, I think, a topic that was discussed here about the uncertainty of estimates. Uh, you know, Kuznex, when he put together national accounts, thought that there should be interval estimates, not point estimates. And there was a lot of wisdom in that comment, but as we can all imagine, if you give a policymaker an interval, it's not going to be very happy with that. So, you know, we, so we, we're sort of forced to give interval um, point estimates but it's really not conveying the true uncertainty about it. So we've, we've tried to think about ways using revision data to sort of convey that there's, there's, there are bounds here, there are confidence intervals, there, there are things that we need to convey about what you may expect in the next revision. Um, so I think that communication and, and, and the SNA needs to confront that. The other thing is we have all these great measurement topics to address but I don't think enough attention is paid to the source data that could be used to, to construct measures that may get to these questions. So we, I, I spend a lot of my time looking for source data that can be used, uh, the quality of source data, what are we gonna do when survey responses are falling, how are we gonna mix administrative data with survey data, uh, the plenary session today, Cavallo talked about s s web scraping, how are we gonna move that into price indexes, and if we do bring these alternative sources here, then the topic I just mentioned about confidence intervals for price deflators then becomes more important because when you talk about quality change, different people will have different ideas of what quality change is, and maybe a single deflator isn't the right one. We're confronting this issue now with our health expenditure accounts. Uh, we're looking at quality adjusted Price, uh, price indexes for our health expenditure accounts which are by disease. And so what's an improvement in a heart attack? Different people will have different ideas about how to measure 
quality change for heart attack treatments. Should we come up with a single deflator or should we give users a few deflators to choose from which one meets your measurement needs? So these are the kinds of issues I think that you know, have to be commented on and it'd be nice if there was some consensus about how to, how to deal with them. Okay, thank you, uh, Dennis, and thank you, all of, all of you, for, for the first uh, round uh, of interventions. Actually, uh, I was still writing down, you were too quick, uh, Dennis. <laughs> I will say, well, when I look at the, at the list of issues that have been brought forward, a lot of them, I think, feed into the priority areas that I mentioned, digitalization, okay. globalization, and... Uh, uh, well-being and sustainability, and uh, a lot of the, the, the issues around IPPs, intellectual property products, trade in, in intangibles, is part of the globalization agenda because that the, the, the Irish problem was the, the, the relocation of intangible assets or the relocation. I don't know why they all want to go to Ireland, but uh, there seems to be a reason to, to deploy as those activities in Ireland. But uh, it's, it has a lot of attention, uh, obviously. I was surprised by the, the number of times uh, you mentioned issues related to environmental sustainability, mm -hmm. land, ecosystem assets, natural capital, etc. It's included, but and, and there's a lot of work going on, but definitely I, I take that on board uh, as, a, as a message from uh, you as well. A couple of other points uh, were mentioned. Uh, interconnectedness, uh, I think financial risks and vulnerabilities is also <laughs> something that, that is being addressed uh, it, as part of a G20 data gaps initiative. A lot of work is being done there, but it's very important. So with that, I, I now turn to you for uh, okay. Questions, remarks, suggestions, whatever. Okay, that, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Sharon. <laughs> Peter Sinclair, uh, the University of Birmingham. National accounts concentrate chiefly on goods and services. I think in uh, the ESCOE conference in 2069, when the wonderful discussion here is played back to them, we'll, we'll say what a lot of things they suggested that were important. But there seem to be two things which I, above all, I think are going to be really pressing. One is that the nation state is in some cases fragmenting or warping. It's a much weaker institution in many parts of the world than it used to be. The other is there are not just goods and services, there are bads. Economics has this unfortunate assumption of free disposal. We're now learning that's wrong. So I think I strongly support the uh, recommendations from Kevin Fox to try and soup up environmental aspects of accounts, particularly with the risks of serious global warming. Thank you. Martin, Martin, Ma Martin? In, in the middle. Ah, OK. Yeah, Martin. First of all, please, a question probably for Jonathan and Kevin between them. How important is intangible capital relative to land in the United States? What's you know, intangible cap the stock of intangible capital worth relative to the stock of land? Mm -hmm. It's a question that's puzzled me, and you know, it would be nice to have a collective answer. Secondly, picking up on what... Joe said about the, and you've said about the importance of well-being. It seems to me that if we want to discuss well-being, we have to have data that show and reflect the distribution of resources. And of course, the Blue Book used to include distributional data from, I suppose, the late 1940s until probably the early 1970s. So could we bring those back into the national accounts and give them probably a more central role? Thank you. Yeah, okay. important point, I think, distributional data. Yes. And it, it is part of the agenda, yeah. They seem to agree with you all. Okay, please. I was also expecting Sanjeev to, to, to put up his hand, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
thank you. It's uh, Darren Morgan from the Office for National Statistics, and I have the privilege of one of the things within my remit is UK's GDP numbers. So good list to listen to how we the challenges we face. So what struck me, I got a bit of an observation on what Jonathan and Joe touched on, actually, and then share with you a little things that uh, very briefly share with you some things we're doing in the UK to address. And then I got a question, I think, like opposed to everyone, actually, what, they, what their thoughts are. And it, it sort of struck home the public trust and legitim the legitimacy is sort of a key factor for, for us. And then Jonathan and Joe both said that globalization has led to business models that were unrecognizable perhaps 20 years ago. And this is one of the key challenges, sort of national statistical institutes across the world and, and are sort of tackling with at the moment. And what it be, and we all talking about it, which was really nice. And then what became affectionately known as the Irish case sort of all of a sudden helped focus everybody's minds that this was actually something we need to do a bit more seriously, take a bit more seriously. So different countries are taking different approaches to tackle the challenges. And one of the things in the UK we are doing is that we've set up an international business unit. Um, this unit looks at the structure and the organization of businesses. Because um, if we understand them, how they operate, we've got a much better chance of measuring them appropriately, which is, which is a good thing. So we were alive to the challenge in the UK, some of the things have been said. We started to meet the challenge, but there's, there's more to do and it isn't easy. So this goes on to my question that I've got, which I think would be really interesting to get the perspectives from everybody is do you think the SNA framework is fatally wounded <coughs> with the evolution of the modern economy? Or is it the measurement within it is that it's the key challenge that needs to be addressed? It's a very fundamental question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm not a panelist. Uh, <laughs> Sanjeev, please. Two minutes, eh, Sanjeev. <laughs> I'll have to speak very quickly. Now, um, thank you very much for those uh, sort of slimline tonic presentations. Um, and I actually want to echo a little bit what Darren said, but where I was going to come from was we are statistical producers and we're part of the chain. So people provide data to us, we produce, and we have a whole set of diverse suite of users. And our challenge, in one, one of our challenges, is to meet all of the requirements. So when you described your requirements from a limited set, actually they were quite diverse. So where I looked at this, I thought, well, we need to educate the users. GDP is not the only part of the national accounts. The national accounts framework is huge, and then as associated with that, we have extended tables, supplementary tables, satellite accounts. There are ways we can interconnect consistently with the national accounts framework and better meet our user needs. The things that you described, I try to categorize them in line with what we did at the ANG. Some of those issues are conceptual, but many of them are, are method, methodological, but more importantly, measurement. Mm -hmm. And it's the quality of measurement, the cost required to collect the data to support that measurement is paramount. Prices and volumes is a massive challenge. So measuring current prices are nominal, great. Volumes, you don't observe many of those, very difficult. So one of the thoughts I had was, how would you s support a, a program to better sell the various existing outputs that we have with some quality indicators. So for example, we focus a bit more on net, net national income adjusted for depletion and or degradation. We have that as a package of other outputs of the National Accounts Framework and educate users of what's there and what's available. And my actual question for you ultimately is, if you take your personal top priority of what you would like the next SNA to include, whether it's intangibles, capital, you can have all the capitals if you like, household production, etc. How do you think that can actually be achieved? Is the how. The wish list is great, now and move to the next step. What are your ideas on the how? Okay, thank you. Yeah, please. Richard Hayes, ONS. Just thinking about the question on missing capitals, it strikes me that when we think about the public services, investment in health, in education, is effectively a process of creating some of those missing capitals, human capital, natural capital, and for free environmental regulation, this sort of thing. That would require us to do quite a significant rebranding of a lot of public services as public investment. 
Uh, I'd like your thoughts on that and how we'd communicate that to users. Yes, one there. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just following from Kevin and Dennis's point, which was, to some extent, both of them alluded to sp some sort of specialization um, in the SNA, where you know, Kevin and New, Ze New Zealand might want to particularly focus on uh, kindness and uh, Australia on land. I mean, is there a degree to which, in going forward in the SNA, individual countries should specialize in particular sectors or areas? I mean, whether I mean, the US is clearly at an advantage in trying to measure the economic impact of the digital behemoths, the, the very large companies. Whether for the UK there are priorities in terms of which industries or sectors or parts of the economic activity chain that we're particularly productive or, or harm, harmful at. Whether there's um, industries or sectors where our measurements, specialization might be, might be more targeted, and that might be a priority for us <coughs> going forward in the SNA. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm thinking things like legal services or, or fintech or, or, or areas of the economy where you know, talent and capital and IP is being invested heavily. Thank you. I count down. Ah, there is one. We're all um, very concerned about uh, the environmental issues, but does it follow that um, incorporation of natural capitals or, 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 or environmental concerns in the wider sense it is well achievable in the National Accounts Framework? Uh, nature, you could say, is something that um, pre-exists and stands outside of human activity is affected by human activity but is not an objective of it. Uh, or more tangibly, if we re refer back to the IPC's report or to Nick Stern's review of climate change, uh, do those, are those studies, do they give meaningful answers and remedies, do they offer meaningful studies uh, in the framework of GDP in which they're written? If they do, uh, then is there a limited gain to be had from an overambitious incorporation of, of, of natural capital into the GDP framework? Thank you. I, I suggest that we, we close the round of uh, questions and give each of the panelists t two minutes, <laughs> if that's possible, Jonathan. <laughs> possible? Yep. Yeah, you can pick the, uh, pick the question that you like, <laughs> and, uh, or, or you are able to answer and forget about the others, isn't it? Um, I, I, I'll try to be very quick. Apologies if I don't answer particular questions three. Um, Martin Wheel's question about the stock of intangibles versus the stock of land, the capital stock. The capital stocks, I'm sure, are very different. The capital services, I suspect there'll be more from intangibles, but we should check that out. I like very much Darren Morgan's thought about uh, notions about this international business unit. To the extent that the concepts in the SNA are the right concepts, but the measurement issues, which Sanjeev talked about as well, are really difficult, we need to, it seems to me, a bit of innovation in measurement. And going and talking to particularly these international firms is a very important innovation in measurement and trying to understand all of that, so I'd support that very strongly. <coughs> Can I just say one last thing on, on the issue about legitimacy in all of this? Um, the thing that, we, that, that bothers me, as I say, is this notion that, you know, bad money drives out good, you know, bad statistics going to drive out good statistics. There's lots of competition statistics or lots of people who are producing other statistical things. Is, will that leave no room for national <coughs> statistical authorities and all this, that, and the other in the future? And if you think about it, and that seems to be a very depressing prospect, it seems to me, but if you think about the bad money drives out good... The point about that, it seems to me, is that it's completely flat wrong. It's totally the other way around. The minute that, you know, in a society there's hyperinflation and all of that, everybody goes to the US dollar. In other words, it's the good money that drives out the bad. 
And that seems to me to be a maxim which gives me a bit of heart about national statistics. As long as we can keep the reputation of national statistics going, then we're in a position of being able to say to users that the good statistics, which is the stuff that people in this room are committed to, it will hopefully drive out the bad statistics. And that seems to me to be key to the legitimacy issue. Thanks. Joe? Um, I think two things struck me. The first is um, uh, I, I definitely take the point that there, is a, there are two parallel issues here. The one is what are the issues of the SNA, the priority issues, and what is the action agenda? What are the, what are the, the priorities there? Sanjeev so made that point. I think it's implicit in, in Darren's um, uh, comment as well. So I think it's important uh, not uh, to confuse those issues, but also to bear both in mind. Uh, I, 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 in response to Kevin's comments, I mean, I think there's a, there was, this sort of subtle difference between um, the beyond GDP agenda and the GDP and beyond agenda. And I'm very firmly in the GDP and beyond agenda. I don't think there's a question of sort of throwing away this thing we developed, this thing of some beauty actually we developed over many decades. It's sort of say, let's forget about that, let's go down some new path. But that doesn't mean that, that there aren't extensions and refinements that are actually going to be needed uh, and necessary. So I'm GDP beyond. Um, I thought Richard's point, Richard Hayes' point about um, some of these things we think of as current expenditure in this kind of world, if we're thinking about other kinds of capitals, assume some of the nature of investment, I think is, is actually quite important. Um, if you think about education, for example, as a way of forming human capital, well, is that really current expenditure by governments, um, or to what extent is this really um, investment, ditto with natural capital enhancing expenditures and, and so on? I'd just like to take up my Lion's point about um, uh, should we are we being uh, a bit silly in um, uh, trying to uh, bring um, natural uh, asset considerations into the national accounts? Uh, I think we're not being silly in terms of trying to systematise that information in a way which can be considered alongside the national accounts. And I think the the existing um, uh, uh, protocols that are available allow us to do that. Uh, where I think there's actually a great similarity between uh, natural assets and the things we traditionally think of in the national accounts is that it's possible and sensible to think about natural assets in a integrated stock flow uh, kind of way. So on the one hand, you want to know about the stock of natural assets, the stock of natural capital, because that tells you about sustainability. Uh, but you also want to know about to what extent are you sweating those assets in a way which brings benefits to all of us or, uh, as Peter Sinclair mentioned, in some cases, bads. So I think, uh, I, I think there is value. I don't necessarily want to say that, we have a com that uh, natural capital becomes part of national accounts, but I think having uh, information available which is systematically uh, comparable with each other probably is a way of enriching public debate. Uh, first on the issue about uh, land versus intangibles, which is more important. Um, to some extent, it depends on the country. I think countries like the US and Australia, uh, the value of land just massively bigger than the value of intangibles. But somewhere like Singapore, uh, perhaps, I'm not so sure. It might uh, not be that way around. Um, and the other, but the, I mean, really, that, I don't know if that's the key issue, which is larger by value. It's which one is growing more quickly. And I think that's why what makes intangibles a lot more um, relevant, uh, because we think that the accumulation of intangibles is growing more quickly, say, than uh, changes in the quantity of land, uh, however that's measured. But with land, we need to do some quality adjustment, and that quality adjustment is very key. And, and this gets to this point about whether the environment should be in the system of national accounts. Uh, so people in the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources in Australia tell me that what's needed to grow crops is one, one inch of good topsoil. Slightly less than one inch, nothing grows. Okay. So it's very precarious, right? It's, and you can be growing crops right up to that point where you get below that one inch and then you go from producing things and thinking everything's fine to producing nothing. Now, what, why would you lose that one inch of topsoil well, it could be because of climate change. It could be due to mismanagement of water resources, meaning the land gets dry and the soil blows away. Uh, so that, that means, I mean, it's all very much involved with our activities in production, agricultural production in this case. So I think clearly 
we need to take into account the, f the impact we're having on the environment and the ability of the environment to produce uh, for us. O on producing for us, this is, um, I, mean, I like the way, uh, some of you might know Carl Obst, he used to be head of national accounts at the uh, ABS and he's now um, very much involved in the UN system of environmental economic accounting and ecosystem services accounting. I like the way he thinks about this, that uh, ecosystem services can be thought of, say, as a um, carbon sink. So through manufacturing, et cetera, all these bads are produced, uh, but they're absorbed by ecosystem services, uh, by wetlands, et cetera. So if you don't value them as providing that service to us, then you might decide to get rid of the wetlands and pave them over and build a nice jacuzzi there or <laughs> carport or whatever, uh, and you, you're diminishing the <laughs> ability to provide, for the environment to provide you a service, which is to help mitigate the bads that are produced. So I think it's very important that we do a good job or a better job in trying to um, measure the impact of uh, the environment on our economic activity. Specialization across countries, should some countries behave differently? I think that already happens within the system of national accounts. I mean, some countries move more quickly to capitalize R&D and uh, other intangibles. Australia was rather an early adopter of the recommendations. <laughs> See, the, the <laughs> there's a, you know, the standard set of rules and still <laughs> you can complain about uh, optimal speed of adoption of uh, the recommendations. Uh, so countries do prioritise uh, given their own particular circumstances. I think Australia put a lot of em effort into understanding the mining sector more than other countries um, might have. Um, and, and how are we going, you know, how are all these changes going to happen? Uh, you know, how are we going to get this to really take place? Well, we need a lot of people thinking hard about these problems and talking about them. And I think the ONS has done a great thing by setting up ESCO because that provides a forum for us to have these kinds of discussions. So this is how we're going to get this done. This is how we're going to achieve changes by, uh, you know, national statistical officers valuing the uh, valuing the importance of adapting with the times, of the uh, importance of having to change. We can't just be uh, static. And I remember Zvi Grilikis and talking about the, the old computer pr uh, productivity paradox back in the 70s and 80s, where he said, well, you know, the, the data just hasn't kept up with the times, and uh, measurement has always been difficult, so what's new? Well, the accounts were set up in a, a simpler time and haven't kept up with the economy. And now here we are again, and I don't think this problem's gonna away, go away. We're always going to be trying to catch up with changes in the economy. Uh, and you know, the, the extent that national statistical officers appreciate that and realize that they have to invest in order to make progress towards getting closer to what we want to measure, um, I mean, that's, that's the solution, right? That, that it has to be that realization. So I'll pick up what Kevin said. I, I fully agree with what Sanji said. It, it, the issue of the source data, the measurement concepts, these are things that have to, have to be worked out. The, you know, we're, we are also doing a lot of work on land, and uh, Kevin's worked on this stuff as well. The valuation of land is crucially dependent on the price index for, for land, and that is usually it's the values done as a residual. And so it's, then you need house price indexes for all the residential land. So these are not trivial measurement issues that have to be addressed before you can get a, a value of land. Regarding the specialization here, I always thought that the whole concept of satellite accounts is underused uh, in the national accounts framework. Uh, it allows countries to specialize in things that are very important to them and set aside within the framework of national income accounting how they would handle things that are their particular problems. And I, I really think that that's something that we could develop more uh, as an experimental lab for different measurement techniques here. The land accounts, uh, land valuations, that's probably what we will do initially. Uh, different public land, private land, different house price indexes. As I mentioned, it's probably what we're gonna do with uh, when our disease-based health expenditures uh, come out. We use that for R&D accounting for several iterations before we incorporated it in the uh, national accounts. So this is, a, a, I think, a much underused feature of the SNA to get at a lot of these measurement issues without touching the GDP statistic that everybody's interested in and, and allowing for these adjustments to GDP as users see fit. Uh, 
based on those uh, measures. Thank you. Uh, let, a couple of uh, c concluding remarks. I will not make a, a summary of all things that have been said, but I, I wanted to, to emphasize one thing, and Joe mentioned, but Kevin and, and Dennis also touched upon. I think all of you have touched upon. It's the this, this difference between beyond GDP and GDP and beyond. Uh, it's not always about changing the, 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 the framework of, of economic accounts, but it's perhaps we should think harder about broadening the framework of accounts, of national accounts, and I do, do not use the word economic, so that we have a broader framework in which we will have, for example, this, this accounting for uh, environment, which is a, a very important and crucial element, I think, in, in, in the future economic developments, that, that we develop these accounts for the environment, including, and there's a lot of work is at the moment currently be taking place in accounting on ecosystems and how to align that to the system of national accounts, how to arrive at a, at a way which is consistent with the accounting thinking of national accounts. And uh, really, a lot of work is, is, is going on in, in this respect. And I think we're making progress, although it kept me awake a couple of nights uh, in the past four weeks. It's not an easy question. I, I had to write something in that uh, that regard, and I was it was turning around and around in my brain, and I was actually waking up in the middle of the night. I was thinking of ecosystem assets. It's that that goes too far, you know. <laughs> the other point I I want to pick up is <coughs> we have to think about. Uh, the business model of compiling national accounts, compiling statistics. Mm. I think that's an important issue in the globalized uh, world. For example, the, the, I take one example. We are thinking, and Kevin already said it, about economic ownership of IPPs. If you say, well, I don't like what he said, that we should uh, allocate it to the country where it has been done, the R&D, no, I think it should be going back to the headquarters of the multinationals. But if you want to do that, it requires a lot of exchange of data mm -hmm. across countries. And all, all these multinational activities, to capture them consistently across countries, we may need to think about another business model. Uh, so with that, all I want to say, if you want to, 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 to keep involved in, in discussions. There is an SNA 2008 website uh, where you can follow it. It's a bit slow. It's not, not uh, in, in, in getting all the documentation on it, but it gets there uh, in, in time. There's also a very nice uh, website of the System of Environmental Economic Accounting, SEEA. 2012, Google that and you will get there. There's a lot of information on what's going on uh, momentarily. So I advise if you're interested, step in and, and uh, look at the information. If you have comments, suggestions, send them. Uh, if you don't know to whom, send them to me. Uh, with that, I want to close the session only to say that you're not allowed to have a break now. You should go directly without any coffee or, <laughs> any, or, or a cigarette, some of us, to the eighth floor. There will be a poster session, but there will also be drinks. So with that, I close the session uh, thanking the panelists for their contribution. Thank you.